I have two choices in this life. One, I can keep going down this path where I'm just angry and pissed off about things that I cannot control, or I can go down this other path where I just try. I just try, and I try to take the hand, pun that I intended, that I'm dealt, and I make the best of it, right? All right, hello everybody and welcome to the What You Don't Hear podcast. It's a life podcast. It's a life story podcast. It's an open journal dive into people's lives as I sit and I uncover the real story behind my guest journey, finding out what makes them who they are and everything that they do, talking about all the ups, all the downs, and all the thoughts and feelings in between, uncovering the parts of their story that, well, otherwise we wouldn't get to hear about. I am your host. My name is Ross Tyson. I'm a creative of many kinds, a maker of many things. And as you can probably guess, one of those things I do is indeed podcasting. And I bring you a couple different shows at this point, but this one right here, I bring you every other Monday as well as sporadically on Fridays for those 15 minute Friday episodes. If you really like the show and you want to make sure that you don't miss out on all of that, Here's a quick reminder up front to say suplex those follow and subscribe buttons if you can, especially if you're on YouTube, hit that like button so it tells the algorithm that this show matters to you. You hear it all the time from every creator, uh, and it truly does help more than you may think. So here's how this is going to go. I'm going to tell you about a few supporters of this show, pay some bills, and then we're going to dive straight into this week's episode because it is one that I am very, very stoked to share. So. If you're looking for a place to live now or in the future, of course, that place that I'm going to tell you to go check out is River Enrich. Now, River Enrich brings together quality apartments, desirable amenities, and a vibrant artistic community located right in the middle of the Franklinton Arts District. Now, River and Rich offers one bedroom, two bedroom, and townhouse style apartments with open floor plans, oversized windows, which are always dope, and modern. Finishes. Now, the amenities, those include a huge 24-7 gym, a heated pool, a fully stocked coffee bar, a secure package delivery room, pretty much everything you would need in your ideal place of living. Now, it doesn't just stop at the building because River and Rich embraces and connects with the art-filled Franklinton community around it. They've got local art and murals featured all throughout the community. River and Rich, it's both a place to go home to and is also becoming a piece of living art itself. So if that environment sounds like one that you want to live in, well, of course, you can. So go check it out. They offer both guided and self-guided tours. So go check out an apartment anytime. You can visit their website at riverandrichcolumbus.com for more information. Also, check this out because you listen to this show I'm going to help you get a freaking apartment because for right now, new applicants can receive up to half off their security deposit if you use the code WYDHPOD. So again, for more info, please contact River and Rich. Certain restrictions might apply. Hop to RiverAndRichColumbus.com to get things going and go join the colorful life at River and Rich. We are also supported by our friends over at Promo West Productions, and this is how I support them back. So if you're interested in catching a live show, maybe you'll want to check out one of these upcoming concerts right here in Columbus, Ohio, brought to you by Promo West. They've got the front bottoms at Kemba Live on September 19th. Gus Dapperton at Newport Music Hall on September 18th. Mo also at Newport Music Hall on September 20th. And then Noah Cyrus is happening at Newport Music Hall on Saturday, September 23rd. So if you want to grab tickets to any of those shows, you can by jumping to AXS.com. Or as always in general, for more information on these or any other upcoming shows, if you want to find out who's coming to town and when here in Columbus, you can find all the info you need over at Promo West Live. Dot com. Okay, so this episode of What You Don't Hear, uh, dare I say, is not only my new favorite episode, but maybe truthfully the most important one to me individually that I have ever done. Uh, here's why I'm giving it that title. If you know me well enough personally, 
you'll know that I am a huge fan of pro wrestling and have been for the majority of my life. Um, You'll know just how much I love it, how much it means to me, and how close, honestly, I hold it to my heart, uh, truthfully. So in this episode, I get to sit down and get to know pro wrestler Gregory Iron. Now, Greg is someone that I would actually watch on TV many years ago, um, so it means a lot to now sit down with him and chat for this show. Um, It means a lot to me in general to finally officially have even my first pro wrestler on this podcast. Um, It was a bucket list item for sure, a milestone for this show, and all in all, just an incredible conversation as well that I cannot thank Greg enough for uh, for being down to come to Columbus and share his story with me. Um, And he has an amazing story of, of having Bell's palsy and chasing down his dream and becoming a pro wrestler. He is an inspiring dude with a great and inspiring story. This episode has so much gold in it, genuinely, and yes, of course, there is lots of wrestling talk, because, I mean, when you get two clearly major fans of pro wrestling sitting down for the first time together, that's what's going to happen. So this episode is amazing, it was an absolute blast to do, so let's get to it. Making its way to the ring, yeah, it's episode 92 of What You Don't Hear and my conversation with Gregory Iron. Yeah, no, exa- yeah, exactly. <laughs> like it's it's a hundred percent. We're just we're just chatting and making it happen. Yeah. Um, also, Greg or Gregory? How do you want me to? Uh, I mean, Gregory is the wrestling name, but like you could definitely we're friends. You we Greg, we, we are know? officially friends yeah, now yeah, in real sure, life. For sure. Well, in that case, Greg, welcome to the show, my friend. Thanks for having me, dude. I am so very stoked that we're making this happen. Um, on a multitude of levels. Um, one, we have had to reschedule this a couple times mm-hmm. to actually meet up in person and make this happen. Yep. Um, so in one way, it has been a long time coming in that sense, but it's also been a long time coming because I will just tell you up front, uh, I remember back in the days of flipping to a local Ohio sports channel at like 1 a.m. in the morning mm-hmm. and watching you and the rest of the gang on Pro Wrestling Ohio Yes, very, very late at night. So in that sense, for me, it's also been a long time coming to get to sit down and chat with you about literally just anything Yeah, uh, in that sense as well. That's crazy, man. Like I always forget like the impact and the reach that Pro Wrestling Ohio had. Uh, and yeah. I, I've told this story, I think, before, but like a couple of years ago, I wrestled in Oakland and I had a line of fans to meet me which, you know, that's pretty cool, not abnormal, but it was abnormal in the sense that um, if there were 30 people in line, 15 of them were like, man, I used to watch you out here on Pro Wrestling Ohio or when it became Prime Wrestling, uh, Prime Wrestling, right. and, and you and Johnny Gargano. And, I, and I'm like, I got kind of pissed because I was like inside because I knew that show had so much potential. Mm-hmm. But I think like even when we were told like, oh, we're available in 4 million homes, not 4 million people were watching, but we're available in 4 million homes and all parts of the country if you have a sports package mm-hmm. and just like the promoter was so cheap with the money okay. like like there were good very good moments with that show yeah but there was so much potential to be better and uh when all the fans would just be like oh yeah i used to watch you on there i'm like damn it i wish that show was so much better because like <laughs> obviously it stuck with people for a reason yeah. but man just so much untapped opportunity with the characters, the stories, but there was oh, just no I'm money, sure. no money to it. Yeah, no, I'm sure. I remember I mean, even just thinking that just how cool it was in general that like at that point in time, like, I mean, YouTube was definitely like becoming a thing, but you know, I was the type of wrestling fan that was like anywhere I can find any type of wrestling. That's what I want. So sure. the, the fact that I could turn on, you know, whatever Ohio sports channel at 1am and be like, Here's this like what you know what I wouldn't call at the time an indie promotion you know didn't know that at the time but sure. like, I'm like oh my god there's just more wrestling and what, yeah so it's funny because like from your perspective it is and like now as as like an adult who lives in the production world I can look at that and be like oh yeah there's so many different ways you could produce a really cool show now probably for not a huge budget right but looking back at it at that time you're like yeah there's actually probably so much more we could do and of course with like stories and and you know everything else the, like things were so expensive too at that time because like i think at one point maybe season three or four of pwo we ended up getting a 3d graphic where the pwo logo would spin right and like yeah. and, and so i remember supposedly now i don't know this for sure but this is what we were told because it turned out that this production guy that we were working with was pilfering money underneath our nose but he said that it cost twelve hundred dollars to get this guy to make a five second 3d logo so we're talking 
2010. So we just yeah. believed it because, but now it's like I can go on my phone and just make a 3D logo oh, yeah, whatever I want, like yeah. for zero dollars. So just like I remember being like, God, we we don't even have a budget for three shows for twelve hundred dollars, and we got to buy this logo. It, right, it's wild. To think yeah, about. yeah. No, but that's like that's the fun thing again for for me looking at all that. I like now as an adult, if I look back, I could notice all that. But at that point in time. It was the same to me as like it, you, clearly I could see a difference like I what you know I wasn't a, a, a dumb child but yeah. like I knew there was a production difference but the fact that it was wrestling was still the thing. You what, know what, I mean? what was your first memory of PWO? Like what drew you in? Uh, you know what I don't really remember. Like uh, the main things that I remember are you Gargano, Josh Prohibition, uh, Marion Fontaine. I think if I'm saying that right, I love Fontaine. Um, and oh man, who was the big guy? It was basically like your guys is like Jason Bain. Yes. Yeah. Yes. He's like the, the, the undertaker, the locker room enforcer, right? Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Yes. And, uh, I, I don't know what it, I think it was just the fact that it was like an Ohio based thing. Right. Because at that point in time, and we'll probably dive into this later, but for the longest time, uh, pro wrestling was my dream. That was the thing. I wanted to pursue it. I wanted to do that. So during that time period, finding something like that, that like, yeah, I didn't know anybody there, like obviously personally or anything like that. But the fact that it was like this, like it was pro wrestling Ohio. It was Mm. happening here. These were people from here. It almost gave that more, it felt more realistic. It felt more tangible. Yeah. Right. It felt more in a strange way, even though of course things like WWE or at that time, like TNA and impact and all that sort of stuff, those are the big shows on TV, like with the high production budgets and all that sort of stuff. But there was something about PWO that was like, oh, this is like, like the real, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, again, not that like there's one difference between like something being real and something being produced, but like it felt more at like a, a attainable level. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. Attainable because yeah. like, like it seems so close to home. Cause like for exactly. me, I, I can relate to this. It's like when I would watch the WWF, the only guy from Ohio in like the late nineties was Al Snow from yeah. Lima. And I didn't even know where Lima was. Right. So I was like, ah, oh, I wish we had someone from Cleveland. And so fast forward, I remember the backyard wrestling video game came out for Xbox mm-hmm. and for Xbox, you got like DVD quality features and they're, interviewing m dog 20 matt cross yep. and they're in california filming this and they're like how do you feel to be in sunny california and he's like well it's much better than you know cold wintry cleveland ohio where i'm from and i remember being like whoa wait a second this dude is from cleveland ohio and like he was like tinier and jacked and i was like okay like if he's from cleveland then maybe there could be other wrestlers from cleveland and then right. you know start figuring about wrestling schools but m dog and Josh Prohibition were two of my reasons why it was, it, this was an attainable thing because mm-hmm. th- they were essentially in my backyard. Yeah, so. exactly. And that, I think that was the thing that, like, again, even though half of me as a fan at that point in time was just like, give me every bit of wrestling that I can find, which nowadays I like wish I was a kid who enjoyed wrestling because YouTube is filled. There's yep. the network out there. The ev- almost every promotion has their own streaming service at this point in time. Yeah. It's like, like, I literally, that is one thing that I'm like, even though I still get to consume it, Mm -hmm. I just know as a kid, I'm like, dude, I had to go and like hope that like a WCW 2000 (laughs) pay-per-view was on VHS at my local video store because I hadn't gotten to see WCW 2000. (laughs) And like, but that was like the peak of my like, if I could just find a pay-per-view from 2000, Uh I've never seen any. Yeah. And now it's like, you could just fire up. Well, now it's you know, Peacock, but like you know, you can just fire it up and mm-hmm. be like, "Hey, what do you want?" I literally remember sitting at the lunch table in sixth grade, so this is like ninety eight, ninety nine, and me and my friends, like our little section of nerdy wrestling buddies, like five or six kids, talking about, you know, what if? Just imagine if there was a twenty four hour wrestling channel how incredible mm-hmm. that would be right and now you essentially have that and i'm just like this is too much wrestling i can't do this like there's wrestling the out thing. every night i just like uh, i like uh there's just a, a new aew show now so there's three of those and two or three wwe shows and they got mlw and impact and it's just like i can't keep up with all this a hundred and that's that's what's funny is like you know because sitting here like i'm still a gigantic wrestling fan to Same. this day and it's funny because like i almost feel guilty or angry at myself for not consuming yeah. as much as humanly possible it's like it. like i'll keep up with like the major shows but like there's some times where i'll miss and i don't feel the like and i'm sure it's just also growing up priorities change but like you know i'm like i'll catch it when i can or i'll just like see what happened on twitter right like i'll just follow like yeah every show also now like live tweets what happened so sure. it's like you almost don't even have to tune in if you really 
don't need to or want to. Right. Um, and so it's like a lot of times I'll catch up, but I'm like, why would I do that? Like, I literally can just go home and just turn it on. Right. Like an hour after it was on TV yeah. anyway. It doesn't matter. Like, I get to find all of these things. And like you said, the amount of stuff that's out there now, it's not just like, I mean, when I was growing up, so like I started watching right after WCW closed. Okay. How old are you? I'm 30. Okay. Yes. Um, so like my stepdad was a wrestling fan. He introduced it to me. Um, and I remember like glimpses of like WCW and stuff as a child, right? For some reason it's ingrained in my brain. Um, maybe it formed some sort of uh, trauma that I didn't realize. I remember seeing, do you remember when uh, Hogan pushed Big Show, Giant at the time, off the top of the arena when they were doing the monster truck How thing? How could I forget? That is like such a distinct memory to me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like when I think back of like, like before I started watching on my own, like those are the memories that pop up of like, oh, when I was watching with him and for some reason, <laughs> Big Show being pushed off the top of the arena has ingrained itself into my brain and I didn't like get to re-see that until later when I was like actively, you know, and then you're, you've got like a, you know, Monday Night War VHS or whatever that came out that was yeah. like showing moments. I'm like, that's what that was. Uh -huh. Now I remember that did happen. Yeah. Survive the fall. Uh, supposedly, he's falling into the water, which the water is not located outside of Cobo Hall in Detroit, where that took place. And then, you know, Hogan comes to the ring for the main event. This is Halloween Havoc 95, by yeah. the way. And uh, he starts to cut this almost somber promo. Like, you I know, him, he's about to announce that the giant has tragically passed away after being accidentally pushed off the building. But then giant with no water on his body. No wounds whatsoever, he's no fine. bruises. He's not limping. He just comes to the ring and wins the WCW World Heavyweight <laughs> Championship. But yep. not uh, after, of course, you have the, the Yeti of the, come to the, the ring. The Yeti, to dry which is, home. of course, physically a mummy. Yes, yes. It's supposed to be a mummy, but uh, he's <laughs> uh, Yeti, Yeti should be, you know, frozen and... Uh, uh, yeah, you know, semantics. It doesn't the, matter. Of course. And then uh, the dry humping that occurs between the giant Hogan and the Yeti. Uh, mm -hmm. Very, very exactly. legendary stuff. I'm, I can see why you would be traumatized, but I would figure more so by the dry humping that occurred post-match <laughs> right? more so than the fall. I somehow forgot the Yeti, just remembered the giant uh, <laughs> falling to his death, uh -huh. apparently, yeah. allegedly. And then, of course, coming back that night. And, uh, hey, this is a good moment uh, for the show. Any non-wrestling fans out there that check this out, welcome to the show, because uh, these are the conversations <laughs> that are going to be happening here. Yep. Um, but yeah, like that's, that's the thing is like looking back at all of that, I had very vague memories of just stuff like that. And I, I started officially watching in 2002. Okay. Like that was like when I was like cognizant enough as like an eight or nine year old to be like, Oh, there's a specific channel that stuff is on mm -hmm. Mondays. And at that time, Thursdays. Yep. Um, and so like the, the whole reason I brought that up was like, I, you know, I, that, that I started watching right after, like, WCW closed, right? So I grew up with pretty much only WWE, and then once internet was really becoming a thing, I discovered that, like, Ring of Honor is a thing, and then everything starts getting put on YouTube. And, of course, also as a child, I'm like, oh, my God, backyard wrestling? This is dope. Like, right. And, of course, I find out about Matt Cross and, you know, all this sort of stuff. And I'm like, all right, yeah, so then that, like, the whole point of that is when something like a PWO pops up, I'm like oh my God, more wrestling, right? Yeah. And then because it was a handful of years before like TNA really be started becoming a thing. But again, anywhere I could find it is where I would just go because for a while I know Impact was on at like 4 p.m. on like Friday evenings on a another random Ohio sports channel. Yeah. is like at least where it was here. Yeah. And again, like 4 p.m. on a Friday, I'm like, yep, I'm glued to the TV because I need to watch this. And so all of that to say... As an adult now, with every ability to watch literally every show that I want of a wrestling show, it's weird because like I almost feel like I'm letting that child version of me down because I'm like, dude, you have everything you want now. You don't have to wait for the random VHS to maybe show up at your video store. Yeah. There's a network. There's a streaming service for almost everything. There's 97 weekly shows from every promotion mm -hmm. that exists. Yep. You have access to all of it. I, I, I feel like I'm letting that child down in me too, but also by the same token, speaking from someone that got into wrestling and then let wrestling consume him for the last 17 years, I try not to feel so bad because I think there was a point in my wrestling journey, uh, making this my profession, where I thought 
I had to have it be all consuming in my life. You know what I'm saying? And I forgot for like, I'm very pop culture literate. And I think when I start wrestling in 2006, all of a sudden, like my knowledge of movies becomes really skewed and TV shows because it's like everything in my life, especially training with and living with Johnny Gargano, who's now in WWE and and did things for NXT for a long time. I felt like I always had to keep up with him and he was just naturally talented. Right. And me, you know, I have this disability, cerebral palsy, and I can't do all the moves he can do. So it's like I need to be knowledgeable in storytelling and, like, know the history of wrestling. And so I just – there's a period of time between, like, 2006 and, like, 2015 where I'm just like I don't know much of what was happening in the world and I'm trying to catch up now. So, like, I try not to let myself down too much as a doll because I'm like I wish I could watch watch more of this, but – I remember that I like other stuff too. Yes. It's weird. A hundred percent. I mean, it works the same way even in like the creative industries that I found myself in. It's like I had that burnout period where I was like, all I think about and all I do are like projects and filming things. And, and, and of course there's, there's a time and place where you do have to put the work in. Of course you have to kind of like get the tunnel vision and really, really focus in like, how can I become the best version of me in this thing that I want to do? Yeah. But there is a balance just like with everything. And like I found that exact same thing where I was like, why do I only like hang out with like other production people? Or why do I only like I I found it for a while like it became hard. Maybe hard is still even a strong word, but like a bit odd to have conversations with people that weren't also doing something creative. Mm -hmm. Right. Or wasn't like pursuing something. And, And I mean, I'll be honest today. It still sometimes is like I can talk to anybody about anything, but I'm also just the type of person who, like, I like to lean into, like, hey, what are your passions? What are the things you want to do? Yeah. Even if you currently have a job that you hate, let's talk about why you hate it and maybe how you could get out of it and what you really – like, those are the conversations that I, like, unashamedly will just say that, like, I would prefer to have, right? Yeah. But for a while, I don't think I could identify why I wanted to have those conversations based off the idea of connecting with somebody. Sure. I more so was like, why aren't they talking about a creative endeavor? Because that's all I do. I get it. I get and, it. And so, being a creator myself and like artistic, like I don't know. It's hard for me to understand when someone doesn't do those things. But also, I'm trying to be better about understanding over the last few years that, you know, I think as a society, especially with like social media and movies and TV and stuff, um, and people that you know post motivational things on Instagram or motivational speakers, which is something I'm been trying to do, but mm-hmm. the pandemic kind of slowed that down a little bit. It's like. Um, I think we're all special in our own way, but I think people need to understand that you could be special without being a content creator or 100%. a professional wrestler or someone famous. Like you could be special because you just like watching professional wrestling. You're passionate about watching it, right? You don't have to be out there making it. Um, if you're passionate about bagging groceries at the grocery store, more power to you, right? Because like there's something incredible about passion that like you know, if you knew nothing about pro wrestling right now, and who knows how deep this conversation is going to go, but when you hear me talk about pro wrestling and you see it in my eyes and the way I, the, the infliction in my voice, it's like, um, maybe you don't know pro wrestling, maybe you don't get it, but you get passion because passion is a universal language. So if you hear the way I'm talking about it and you see it in my eyes, you don't get it, but you get it because you get passion. Everybody's passionate about something. So that's the way I try to look at it. It's like, you don't have to be special by being in the public eye. You could just be passionate by being a supporter of things and just, I don't know, you don't know the impact that you make on someone's life, a friend, a family member, based on how you carry yourself, what you do. And you don't have to, that doesn't have to be filmed, right? Like it's what you do when the people don't see you that is the character that you are. It's like, you know, I I was making a joke yesterday on the road trip about uh, some video on Instagram where a guy was mocking those people that film themselves when they're doing nice things for homeless individuals. Like, and it's like, you know, the the way the guys talk, it's like, Hey, uh, do you have anything in this store for a dollar? All I have is a dollar. And the guy's like, no, we have nothing for a dollar. He's like, are you sure? Cause I'm filming. So you don't have anything for a dollar. And the guy's like, Oh, you're filming this. Yeah, we have this right here. And he goes to hand it to him. He's like, Oh my God, that's so, that's so thankful for it, for that opportunity. Oh, you're such a courageous individual. Here's a hundred dollars. And right. so like my, my girlfriend, I'm sure she doesn't want me to put this over, but you know, we were just, uh, going to go see the big gumball machine over by the library. So she wanted to put some quarters in and a homeless man walks by. And, you know, we're putting quarters in a gumball machine. He's like, you guys have anything? And I'm like, oh, we don't have anything. Sorry. It's just like my go-to. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, I'm sorry. Um, 
And then as he's walking away, she remembers that she had this gift card for a restaurant that she had got for another homeless individual that comes into the library that she works at, and she hasn't seen that person since. So in that moment, she thought about that and ran over and gave him the gift card so he can get something to eat. And she came back, out and I said, well, you really dropped the ball. You should have filmed that so everybody knew that you were a really good person. Yeah, that, you know? that was good content you just did right there. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, that's, and that's 100% accurate, and that is like where – like it was never that deep – but I 100% agree with you on like where I've now found myself is on that side of things. Like, that's why I say like, I don't care what somebody does. I just know like, I want to have an engaging conversation with them. Right. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that a normal conversation can't happen. True. Sure. But that's still the residual, like leftover difficulty sometimes is, you know, someone can sit and complain to me and be like, yeah, dude, uh, work sucks. I hate it. Well, cool. We don't need a life changing conversation, but I do want to know, well, why do you hate it? And like, cool, you can let me, like, I want to give you the space to vent to me a little bit. And then not that I'm going to have answers for you, but maybe advice or opinion or just an outside thought helps change a perspective. And again, it's like all that sort of stuff. Like there's a a quote a couple years ago that I heard that, you know, ever since I heard it, I was like, okay, yeah, like this is like, I love this. And it's kind of what you were saying of like the idea of who are you when no one else is around? Like that is the measure of your actual character. Like, are you the same style of person when a camera isn't on, right? Are you still going to do those nice things? Do you still want to have those types of conversations? If I wasn't making a podcast and you and I were just meeting up for coffee or lunch, we'd probably be having a really similar conversation. 100%. Like uh, it's going to be the same thing because that's just naturally how I like to get to know people, which of course is why I even wanted to start the show in the first place. I'm like, okay, well maybe I could make something fun out of it. Mm -hmm. And then instead of just me and this one person connecting, other people can connect to that person or me through the story that we share. Yes. And so, yeah, it ultimately doesn't come down to like whether someone is creative or pursuing a thing or like has some really cool job or is on TV or whatever. It's like, Hey, no, like everybody has something unique and special about them. And that's why, like, I think that those things are important. It's half the reason that this show exists in general as well. You know what I mean? It's like, Hey, cool. Everybody has a really cool story. Yeah. And there's plenty of podcasts where ultra famous people talk to other ultra famous people, not saying that's not valuable, but what if just anybody could talk to anybody? Nobody knows me. You know what I mean? No one knows like, Oh yeah. Ross Tyson, that guy who has that show. Nobody knows that. Yeah. But it's like, well, cool. I still want to shed light on anyone's story that does anything interesting. And you don't know how your life experiences can change an individual like again they might not have any clue who you are but just being transparent and open and vulnerable i think vulnerability vulnerability is a underrated trait that Mm -hmm. people are afraid to show because i don't know i found in my vulnerability over the years i've made the best connections possible with people with just like sharing the things that i went through growing up like Growing up as a kid with cerebral palsy, going through physical and mental abuse with my parents, uh, you know, with the podcast that I've been doing for like four years at this point, talking more open about relationships that hurt me and mental health things that I've gone through. To be able to be vulnerable and share these stories and not be embarrassed by Mm -hmm. some of the things that I went through, someone can hear that and go, Oh man, this dude's going through the same stuff that I'm going through, and that and that that's a connection, right? Because then you don't feel alone, and now you're more open to being vulnerable and opening up. And I don't know, it's just having conversations like this. It's a beautiful thing, a hundred percent. And that's you know, I've often joked on this show that like doing this podcast has become a cheat code to making friends, because like there's no better way to make a friendship with someone. Then like, hey, cool, we're going to talk about your entire life <laughs> right? and everything that you enjoy or don't enjoy or struggle through or whatever. And again, yes, it's being turned into content. It's being made into a show. But like the purpose of that show comes from that authentic and vulnerable place of, hey, we're all more alike than we are different. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter what somebody does, whether it's huge, whether it's not, whether it's whatever. You might not know this person, but I guarantee a part of their story you're going to be able to resonate with. Mm-hmm. Even just the tiniest bit of how they explain something, something they experienced, they went through, whatever, you're going to be able to connect with that. And that, like, I feel like I learned super early on, oddly enough, was like, that's how I wanted to connect with people. Yeah. It was like, even though I didn't know when I was really young what authenticity really was, I still knew when it was there. Right. And it was like, oh, okay, why do we treat this 
friend like this uh, went for no reason at all. Like, I'd rather, that feels weird. I don't know why that feels weird, but it does. And so you're like 100% accurate. And like the, the vulnerability thing isn't something that a lot of people lean into. I think it's probably becoming more of like a, a, a lead emotion maybe now, but it's still such a thing that like people don't, I don't know. It, it, we are still, I feel like a lot of people are still kind of consumed with that. Like, how cool do I look? How cool do I sound? Because, I mean, there's a ton of people who make podcasts just like this one or make content just like this or whatever that I, I feel like personally I can see it when I watch it. I'm like, oh, man, you're just, you're just trying. Yeah. Really, Like, this doesn't come from, like, there's nothing wrong with sharing advice or opinions or tips on something. But, like, if it comes from a real place of, like, yeah. Hey, I actually just want to share this with you. This is my perspective on it. This is what I want to share. Hopefully you get something from this. There's a difference between that and like, oh, like I just happened to stumble upon this like businessman on the street with a Lamborghini. <laughs> right. and I got to You know, it's like yeah. you can tell. And, and unfortunately, I don't think the vast majority of people oddly can tell, but I think the right ones can tell. Yeah. And you know what? I, I think people are still a little bit worried about showing their real vulnerable self, but I'm hoping the way the world's changing and everything, like I think part of the problem is, and this isn't all parents or all people from the previous generation, but like I'll I'll use like you know my parents as an example, like my dad, uh, when he was around, it was like um, he was afraid to show his emotions, you know what I mean, and he started showing those emotions when he was essentially on his deathbed, right, and like still even even in that moment, those moments he had a hard time expressing how he felt, and I like to think that this generation is more open about mental health and the struggles they're going through. And so I would hope that our kids in the future are kind of like, oh, yeah, this is okay. Like, we could talk about this stuff, and it's all right. I don't know. I know some of what my parents went through that they were like, I can't be open about this. But it's just like it's so messed up that they had to experience that to where it's like, nope, nope, let's shield this all. It's fine. Just everything's okay. Just put on a happy face and – we're good to go. Yeah, and just and just keep working. Yeah, and just like keep working, put on the happy face, act like nothing's wrong, and what and and that's like, I I mean again I know it's like it can go both ways. I think there's a happy medium with everything, right? Because some people, I you know I'm sure there's examples of like some people nowadays can take the whole like oh I'm having a mental health day or something like, unfortunately that can be used in a bad way, right? Yeah. And I think it's like when you can find that happy medium, just like being super authentic of like. There's definitely days where I am 100% I'm like, yeah, I don't I really I can't go do this thing today. Like I don't know how I can focus on this thing. Sure. I don't feel well. Yeah. And at the same time, like there's that like balance of like what could I do to make this better for myself? What could I do to work through this but in a positive way, not just the like again, not to make this about this, but like you know what the past generations tended to do was it was just like put on the happy face, act like it's not a thing. Um, and we'll only talk about our emotions when we have literally no other choice but to confront it. And it's like, what if we were just a little proactive and like just kind of continually maintaining and doing maintenance on ourselves of checking in with ourselves and how do we feel? What made me feel this way? Good or bad? What could I be doing better? What could I, what do I not need to work that hard Mm -hmm. on? What if I gave myself a rest day? Like there's all of that balance and that's probably just life in general is like finding out like how we balance this like huge storm of everything. Um, but I do think it's like it has gotten a lot better. And I do just I personally believe that there is so much more value in leading with authenticity in whatever way that that is. I for me, it has created way stronger connections. And that's like somebody could look at it and laugh and think it's cringe. But it's like, dude, even if I was meeting up, with, like I said, if, if you and I were just getting lunch right now, I'd want to sit for probably actually longer than what we're going to sit here today right. and talk about literally everything everything possible Mm -hmm. yeah and that's just like naturally where like most of the time when i meet up with somebody you know not on a podcast i will schedule my day out of like i'm gonna give this like a four hour time block just Mm -hmm. in case sure it doesn't always go that way but a lot of the times we will literally sit there and talk about everything and then the person's like i'm so sorry i kept you this long like i just haven't had a conversation like this in a while (laughs) and i'm like in the back of my mind like I came into this knowing and willing, yeah. right? Because I just know that's how I naturally connect with people. Mm-hmm. I talk a lot. Right. But like for me it also comes down to like and not to like you know, make this about something else entirely, but like I feel like as a person like I understand my why very clearly. And it's kind of there's two parts to it, right? One is storytelling, one is connecting. Mm-hmm. 
And so it's like oftentimes those things blend together with a podcast. Well, cool. We're telling stories and we're connecting as we do it. 100% on the nose. Right. But I can also, I can relate that storytelling element to, you know, why in the creative field, like I know we were talking a little bit before about like me doing video production and stuff. Video production is a portion of what I do, right? Mm -hmm. Because I can identify that that storytelling umbrella for me is like an all encompassing thing. So for me, I love doing that so much. I want to do it in literally any form possible. Yeah. Video, photo, I'll tell a story through a graphic design campaign that I put together, right? There's different ways to do that. And that can obviously lead to connection, but I can also just say, like, take the work part out of it. As a human being, I know how valuable connecting to other people is for me. Oh, yeah. Whether it's a one-hour conversation, a 30-minute one, or a four-hour, five-hour one, I know the value in all of those things. So I can go into any situation being like, I kind of know where my bar is. Mm -hmm. I know where my standard is of like what I hope to get out of this situation, but also knowing what I can give to it mm -hmm. and not just kind of, I, I think that's what a lot of us tend to miss and why things are often maybe harder than what they need to be is we don't know why we like it or we don't know why we want to be a part of it. And it's like, there, there's times where like, I've identified things in life that I'm like, that would be really fun to do. But I don't, like, I can identify, like, I don't know if that really connects to, like, my why. Sure. Right? Like, creating that thing would be fun, but I don't really know if I should. But, some, I but, but sometimes, like, I think you have to take that risk and just try. 100%. You know what I'm saying? Because, like, like I, I found that trying and failing is much better than not trying and regretting. A because there's percent. nothing more painful than regret. And I... Again, I, I, I can keep going back to my dad. It's like, you know, I feel like in a lot of ways he wouldn't verbalize it because God forbid, but I think he regretted a lot of the decisions he made as a person in his jobs, in his relationships. But if he would have tried, I wonder what a difference that would have made. Like if I wouldn't have tried to go to a wrestling school despite – my father telling me it was stupid and a waste of time. Some of my friends that I thought were friends telling me, eh, I don't know if you could do it because you're five foot four and you have a disability. If I wouldn't have tried and failed again and again and again, I don't get to have the successes that I'm having right now. And and I feel like, you know, you talk about finding your why. I feel like I'm constantly finding my why. I, every day I'm revealing more of, and more of my why and it comes down to happiness and peace and i think what i didn't realize with being a wrestler and putting myself out there is i enjoy giving back to people and for a while i thought again when i was just so engrossed in the bubble that is pro wrestling and not liking anything else and i started to get financially in a better position and emotionally in a better position i enjoy giving back to people like gift giving you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like mm -hmm. when I didn't have money to give gifts, like I wish I did to them, but I can't. But it's like giving someone a gift and like seeing the happiness that it, they get from that. Like it, it, uh, it just creates something in me that like you can't even describe, right? And then like outside of wrestling, which wrestling gave me so many incredible things that I wouldn't even dreamt of. Because originally it's like I just want to be a wrestler to prove people wrong, right? That that this mm -hmm. is possible. Like shut the f up, dude. Like I'm gonna do this. And all of a sudden, you know, through being vulnerable, sharing my story that I get to start doing motivational speaking and I have these fans and then kids at schools that come up to me, that instant gratification that I get from wrestling where it's like I get to be the person that I wish would have came to my school when I was being bullied or was going through trauma at home and that person tells me, hey, things get better. You know, like it's going to be challenging for sure, but it's not impossible. The waiting is the hardest part. And you just have to keep moving forward, right? And to, to hear those kids come up to me and say those things, like, that is my why. I think that's my why more than professional wrestling. But I don't figure that out if I don't try to be a wrestler and suck at that first and fail a bunch of times and get kind of okay to where I can trick people that I'm, I'm decent at it, right? Like, I find enough loopholes to where, like, I'm good at a lot of little things in wrestling. It's like, oh, this guy's a good wrestler. Like, ooh, Glad I tricked you there. Now, like, where could I put that else? Podcasting, writing, talking to kids in schools. Like, that is my why is, like, branching out and just – and I think that's a lot of our whys, and we don't realize it. Extending a hand to others, mm -hmm. helping others when you're in a position where you could do so, 
I, I don't I don't think there's any better feeling in this world. A hundred percent. And and just like your point of like those leaving things up to what if or leaving things kind of like a stone unturned, it's like that I think is the power of like when you can understand why you like or dislike something, you understand when you're getting into it. Like, all right, if like because there's still things to this day of like I can identify like uh hey, this project that I'm doing it's not really like totally a game changer, right? It's not maybe the most fun thing that I even want to do, but there's this little bit. And even if I don't care about the project, what I care about is the experience and camaraderie I get with my crew. Yeah. Cool. That answers my why of like connecting with people. Right. So it's like, it still allows you to go in because you're a hundred percent accurate in like the classic, like you don't know if you don't try, Mm -hmm. I'm huge on just trying things. Like I'm, I'm very, very big on just like, just give it a shot. If you can identify that little bit of like, well, why do you want to do this? What do you feel like you like? Because the why can also just be, I just want to give it a shot. Like, I just want to, I just want to try. Yeah. And like, and there have been a lot of things where like, I've just given like a little bit of a shot and I'm like, ah, that didn't really feel like how it, like I thought it was going to feel. And I can identify in me that like, I have a very strange comfort with like the moment I identify that something really doesn't fulfill me the way that I thought it would. Or like, I'm very easily disconnecting from things. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense where I'm like, I could beat myself up for not trying this even more. Or I can say, yeah, we we tried it. And yeah. maybe it didn't work how we wanted it to. And if I feel okay with that, I know that it's like, all right, cool. Let's put that energy somewhere else. Mm-hmm. But if I try and I fail and I'm like, why didn't that work? I need to figure it out. That's the answer. And I know that I actually want that thing. Sure. Yeah, right? 100%. And so, okay, so before we, we keep on this side quest going all the way down, because I know this could be probably three hours worth of a conversation. Mm. You've mentioned like so much of growing up and I would love to just dive straight into where does all this begin for you? Uh, well, I mean, Cleveland, Ohio, mm-hmm. born and raised. And, uh, you know, I guess in a lot of ways, you know, I, some would say I was a miracle baby. I was like premature. I weighed a pound. I was in an incubator for the first three months of my life. And I don't really realize as I'm growing up that I'm different than anybody else you know I just have a weird hand no one really explains to me that I have cerebral palsy they say that I have a stroke but no one really explains what a stroke is right so once I start interacting with other kids and especially when I get in school and I start bullying getting bullied rather uh my parents just tell me just tell me you had a stroke when you were born and your hand doesn't work right okay in retrospect I don't even know if my parents knew how to explain a stroke right? Because it's brain damage. But no one tells me that. I just, my grandma, she was the one that got me into wrestling, one of the best souls that I ever met in my life. And wrestling sort of, I mean, obviously that's the guiding light for the majority of my life, right? And she was a very religious woman. I don't think she understood how to explain a stroke. And so uh, we bond over this wrestling thing and she loves Hulk Hogan. I fall in love with Hulk Hogan. Training, say your prayers, eat your vitamins, believe in yourself. The prayers thing was a big thing for her because she was a religious woman. And so she would always tell me when I go to sleep at night, you know, uh, say your prayers. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I, sh- if I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Amen. And she used to tell me that if I, if I pray to God, he will make my hand get better. So I remember as a kid, I was like, so I would say my prayers just like that. And before I would say, amen, I'm like, and please let my hand get better. Amen. That's what I would say. And so uh, if fast forward, you know, I'm falling in love with this wrestling thing. I have problems at home with my mom and dad. You know, they're abusive to each other physically, uh, verbally. My mom's a drug addict. My dad has alcohol issues. They're always clashing because my mom is stealing money for drugs, stealing stuff from the house, selling it. Uh, my escape is professional wrestling, right? And um, my grandma going to her house is my escape. She passes away from cancer. So now I kind of lose that, but I, I cling on to wrestling. There's a situation where for a second, me and my two brothers, Mike and Zach, we almost get taken away from my parents because my dad ends up going to jail for a second because of my mom. And my mom has custody technically, but then she gets arrested for another warrant that she had for drugs. So we're with my aunt and uncle in Wellington, Ohio. They're also religious. They have this epiphany. 
hey, we should take you to the doctor to see if we can get your hand fixed, okay? And again, I don't think I'm any different than anybody else. Eventually, this hand thing's going to get better. I'm like 11 or 12 years old at this point. And uh, we go to the doctor for a routine physical. And I remember the doctor examining me and basically, matter of factly, going, well, I mean, you have cerebral palsy, so that's technically brain damage. So unless we can figure out a way to fix your brain, you'll always be this way. And I remember being like, oh, okay, and just trying to keep like a game face on. And then I remember walking out to my uncle's truck and just sitting down in the truck and just breaking down because I felt like everything and I'd, ever, I'd ever been told as a kid was sort of a lie and I'm always going to be this way and no matter what I do, this will never change and this sucks. And I think I, because of that, in a lot of ways, there was already some animosity brewing within me because of what I was going through at home, but my escape is wrestling and like cartoons and TV shows, you know, these, uh, these different worlds that I can live in for a moment when everything around me in the real world is bad. And now it just all seems to be a lie. And I don't know, like for whatever reason, I just stuck with the wrestling thing and I can't tell you a specific moment or thing but I just knew that as a kid, and I still had a lot to work out going into adulthood, but I just knew at some point, maybe of something I read or I saw, but I thought to myself, okay, I have two choices in this life. One, I can keep going down this path where I'm just angry and pissed off about things that I cannot control, or I can go down this other path where I just try. I just try, and I try to take the hand, pun that I intended, that I'm dealt, and I make the best of it, right? And I start finding, like, this weird sense of humor based on SNL and, like, Norm MacDonald and, like, movies that I'm watching, this self-deprecation type humor where I make fun of my disability before other people do. And so it's easier for me to cope with. And then I start to find this quick wit that I have within myself and probably doesn't help with my uh, relationship with my dad because I now I have better jokes and one-liners than he does and he's getting kind of angry about that but it's like I'm trying to deal with this issue that I cannot control and then eventually because of like wrestling characters like Stone Cold Steve Austin you know he you know his defiant attitude like you tell me I can't do something I'm going to prove you wrong each and every time I should have did that in the Stone Cold voice but I'm not going <laughs> back now but uh once I heard him say something like that I'm like yeah I need like that BMF Stone Cold Steve Austin attitude of just like, you can't stop me. I'm going to do this. And sometimes like maybe it was just me trying to convince myself because like when things start happening in a positive way, when you keep moving forward like that and just saying F everything, I'm going to keep doing this. And then it starts happening. For me, it was like, oh, this really is possible. I was just saying that, you know, to like fight off the detractors and everything. But it's like, that was a big rambling of where it all began, but that's basically no, that's a great. summary of my childhood 100%. and wrestling fandom. I don't know. Yeah, no, it, it 100% makes sense. I always tell people also on this show, this is the place for rants and rambles. So, like, literally take all the side quests you want. Every podcast I've ever done, once it's over, I go, hey, man, sorry I talked so much. And they're like, no, no, it's a podcast. Yeah, that's nope. what we want. That's you know? the place. <laughs> this is the place for it. Yeah. Um, okay, so I, I love all of that. I want to dig into, like... When does the decision for you kick in that you're like, I really want to give this pro wrestling thing a shot? I, th I think it's seeing Zach Gowan, who wrestled in WWE with one leg, because he does this moonsault onto the big show. And they did an angle to set it up in WWE where he looked like a fan. Uh, he was in TNA before that, but I didn't see that. So when I see this happening, and I it, this happens on SmackDown, by the way, which at the time you could read spoilers online. I do not want to read spoilers because wrestling is everything to me. I want to be surprised by what's happening, which kind of sucks about wrestling today. It's like just everything instantly on social media. That's, and I can yeah, never be surprised true. anymore. Yeah. But I remember just, you know, watching SmackDown. He gets pulled out of the crowd. Uh, he tries to save Mr. America, who's Hulk Hogan in a mask. Roddy you sure? Pike. You sure? <laughs> I, I think so. You got the mustache. He's saying, brother. I don't know. I remember that lie detector. Thing. <laughs> Classic Mr. <laughs> Mr. America. And uh, Roddy Piper being so good at what he does, he pulls off Gowan's leg. And he the way he sells it 
the emotion in his face, like, oh, God, like, I'm in trouble now. Shouldn't have done this. This wasn't just a fan. He's an amputee. Oh, God. Turns out he's a wrestler. Blah, blah, blah. We fast forward to him and Stephanie versus Big Show. He does a moonsault off the top rope with one leg. He takes his leg off to do it. He's not using the prosthetic, and he wins a WWE contract. I remember thinking, like, boy, if this guy could do it with one leg, maybe I could do it with one good arm, right? And I remember couple weeks later he ends up wrestling Vince McMahon at Vengeance 2003 in Denver Colorado and there's a sign in the crowd that says shame on you Vince with a handicap symbol and I remember thinking a handicap symbol like that's such like an identifiable thing when you see it you know what it is and I remember thinking Zach Gallen should wear a handicap symbol on his trunks just put it out there you know like clearly he's missing a leg but just why not own that? And I thought to myself, if I were ever a wrestler, I would wear handicap symbols all over my gear, probably right on my ass. And once I found the training school and, and with Zach's inspiration and then seeing M-Dog and Josh, because it became realistic because they were from Cleveland and I found a school, as soon as I was told, you're going to have your first match, you need to get some gear made, I reached out to a guy, Matt Stryker, not Matt Stryker from WWE, but there was another Matt Stryker based out of Cincinnati. He made gear. He's like, what do you want in the gear? And I was still kind of weird about wearing spandex. Like when I would create my wrestlers in the video games, like I would never wear underwear to the <laughs> ring. That's weird. I mean, like if you could pull it off, great. But I was like, well, Carlito wears those biker shorts, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like somewhere in the middle where it's not looking like underwear. When I would create myself in the video game, I have like a, a tank top on like the Hardy Boys and like the big baggy pants. And I was pres- literally going to say like the Juju, the mid 2000s, like yes. baggy pants and, look. Like- you know, I come to the ring and I have sunglasses on, right? Because you want to look cool. And uh, also, I'm 5'4 in real life, but Every time I create my guy in No Mercy, he is seven foot two. Incredible. <laughs> like, for no reason. Incredible. He's seven foot two. And uh, so, yeah, I was like, uh, I guess I'll get biker shorts like Carlito. And so, the guy's like, what do you want on him? And I remember Carlito had his name on the front and then like the apple on the back. And I go, I just wanted to say Iron because my name's going to be Gregory Iron. Iron on the front and on the back, just the big handicap logo. And for me, it was like, I want to take ownership of this symbol that people look at and go, they, they look at, they look at it as weakness, less than you get the closest parking space in the parking lot. Right. And I wanted people to hopefully if I get successful enough or just, you know, now looking at it, if just one person sees that and goes, wow, I see strength in that handicap symbol. Now it's not just someone in a wheelchair or that's incapable of something. I think people look at disabled individuals and go, well, they can't do this or that without taking the time to, try to get to know who that person is. And I'm very fortunate that my developmental disability isn't as bad as others. But as someone with one, and as someone who has worked with people with disabilities far worse than mine, it's incredible what you can learn about someone who, for example, has cerebral palsy and is in a wheelchair. And even though they can't convey the things that they want to say, it's in here. They just can't bring it to the surface, right? And just the heart that people like that have, it's, it's incredible. And I, I just wanted to change the perception of how that's viewed through my wrestling. And I think in some small way, you know, to a small sector of individuals, I think I've done that, you know, it's, it's a pretty cool thing, but yeah, it all starts with Zach Allen. If there's no Zach Allen, I don't think there's a Gregory Iron for sure. Yeah. So when you decide to enter the world of pro wrestling, what is that process like from a personal standpoint? Like, do you, I think you mentioned it earlier, like, was there pushback from anybody around you who was like, why, why are you going to do that? Or no, you, you shouldn't go do that. You can't go do that. Walk me through that. I don't think there's one person that I told that was supportive of really pro wrestling. I mean, I, my dad definitely wasn't, he thought it was dumb. And honestly, like I wasn't as worried about the disability as much as, I had never really done anything athletic in my life with any level of success. Like I was the kid in class, like 
I like playing basketball, but I'm not good at it. If I get past the ball, every kid in the class is like, Greg, pass the ball. Do not shoot it. Do not do it. And I'm like, no, I think I got it this time. And, you yeah. know, with my one hand, I, you know, like I'm in visualizing like in the movie, like I'm going to get this three pointer from the distance and I'm going to win the game for the team and they're going to go crazy. And they got me on the shoulders. Great. Greg, Greg, and then I just throw and it doesn't even hit the rim at all, not even the backboard. And I'm like, God, you idiot. And so it's like, you know, I want to become a wrestler. I'm finding these schools and like reading the Pro Wrestling Illustrated. And I'm like, oh, there's a Cleveland All Pro Wrestling School. Like, maybe I'll go check that out. It's like, no one thought it was realistic for me to do this. And I remember even after seeing Zach Gowan and trying to convince myself, like, maybe it's possible. I remember when I got a flyer for a Cleveland All Pro Wrestling show ran by JT Lightning. There's a number at the bottom, Cleveland All Pro Wrestling Hotline, okay? And it's like a 216 number. It's just a landline. I don't know this. It says hotline. So I remember I call on the phone and I go, a lady picks up. Hello? And I go, hey, um, is this a Cleveland All Pro Wrestling Hotline? And she goes, hold on a second. And she hands over the phone and it's JT Lightning. Hey, this is JT Lightning, dude. What's up? And uh, yeah, I saw your flyer. You guys have a pro wrestling school, and I'm thinking about coming to it. But then in that moment, I'm like, mm, like I want to tell my situation. And now as I'm telling him the situation, like I have cerebral palsy, and I'm like 5'4", uh, so my hand doesn't work right. And so now I'm not going to pitch being a wrestler. I'm like, but like, do you guys train people to be like a manager or something? Or, you know, before I thought I could be a wrestler, I wanted to be a commentator or a writer because I'm starting to realize getting smarter to wrestling, like these are jobs you can have. So maybe I should do that, which is why I know so much useless wrestling trivia because I didn't think that you have a paper in front of you like Jim Ross or something with factual information. Like you have to know this stuff on the fly, right? So like that's why I don't leave the house and I'm not going on dates. I definitely need to know the history of professional wrestling. 100%. And, um... I try to pitch being a manager and JT goes, which in retrospect is crazy because JT was not very nice to me, uh, very much a hard ass and we did not have a great relationship. But in this first moment, this first interaction that I had with him on the phone, he listens to my story. He listens to my pitch about being a manager and he goes, no, 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 you should train to be a manager. Let me ask you something, kid. Is wrestling in your heart? And when he said that, I was silent. I felt that lump in my throat. And I'm a very emotional guy in general. I connect with wrestling on this deep level, and it just makes me emotional. I remember when he said that to me. I got that lump in my throat, and I waited, and I go, yeah, wrestling's in my heart. And he's like, then you need to come down to the school and train to be a wrestler. And that's what changed it all for me. I was like, I guess I'm going to try to be a wrestler. And then I remember I went down to the school. It was like winter 2005 so I was still technically in high school I was 18 though so I was allowed to start training I showed up no one was there and so I took that as a sign of well I'm not supposed to do this and so I waited till I was done with high school I never went back I started going to Cleveland All Pro shows maybe July of 2006 so right after I graduated the school was still an option I started getting my foot in the door I'm sorry, not July 2006. That's when I started wrestling. I started uh, doing stuff for JT the beginning of 2006. So like January, February, we'd go to the shows. And uh, eventually, I know the school's still there. I wanted to set a timetable, so I always remembered. And WrestleMania 22 was coming up. So I said, weekend after WrestleMania 22, that following Tuesday, I'm going to go to the school. I'm going to do a tryout where you pay 50 bucks to get your ass kicked you bump a bunch of times and if you're into you know self-harm you keep going back (laughs) for some reason i was definitely into (laughs) self-harm and i kept going back and luckily those first few sessions jt wasn't there i was terrified of jt because he was turns out he's bipolar which no surprise if anybody knew jt but I eventually started showing up and he just ran me through the rigors. And again, we didn't have the best relationship, but I do remember those first couple sessions. I don't want to say he was encouraging. That feels like the wrong word. He was intimidating, but also he took the time to test me. Like it was one of those things where he's showing me the basics of pro wrestling, collar and elbow tie up, um, how to drop down, how to bump. And he'd go, every time we would go to do something in training, he'd go, all right, this is a collar and elbow tie up, dude. If you can't do this, I can't keep training you, which is crazy to think about because there's a lot of wrestling schools out there, and JT was definitely this type. He could be very carny. There's a lot of wrestling trainers that will just steal your money. 
Like, they'll run you through the tryout. They'll keep you around for a few months. They know you're never going to make it as a wrestler, and they'll just keep taking money until you, you're just drained and you don't want to come back. Mm -hmm. He could have kept stealing my money, but the fact that he put that ultimatum over my head of if you can't do this, you can't wrestle. If I couldn't do it the conventional way, I had to find a way to do it my way. And so I would just keep doing it until I figured out how to make, make sense of it. And I think that's what, I don't know, I think that what, what makes me an okay wrestler is like creating the illusion that it is possible for a guy who's just over five foot tall with one good arm to kick your ass. Like I had to figure out to make that make sense because the only thing that we have in wrestling, even in a world where we, we mostly know that it's predetermined is like, you have to create real realism in that moment. You know, you have to create logic out of the illogical. That is the art of professional wrestling. You want to get lost in that moment. Just like when you go to see a Marvel movie, you want to get lost in that experience or, you know, I haven't seen a lot of the Fast and Furious movies, but you have to really get lost in those movies to <laughs> think any of that is realistic, right? I yeah. mean, they make millions and billions of dollars, and, like, I've seen some of the scenes from that. Like, that is insanity that people, like, look at that with seriousness, but I think they would probably look at wrestling the same way if they're not a fan because, like, oh, what are you – yeah, you, you, you died yeah. and came back as a ghost in a spot? Yeah. <laughs> like, that's something I've done before. Look into yeah. it. And, uh, yeah, I, I just had to make it make sense. And, uh, you know – even though JT and I didn't have the best relationship, him scaring me was probably the best thing that could have ever happened to me. Mm -hmm. So did you end up staying at his school? Yeah, I, uh, I trained there for, it ended up being a year-ish, but I probably trained with JT for three months before he threw me in the ring. Because again, the carny in him was, okay, this kid can sell tickets for me. And so... I was not ready to be in the ring, but he was like, how many tickets do you think you could sell? And I was like, probably like 15 or 20. So that at the time, that's like 10 bucks each. So it's like, okay, sure. You can be on the show, go buy some gear. And so I was kind of learning on the job, but JT was kind of at the point where he had been training wrestlers for about 10 years at that point, And he was over it. And he knew that every kid in the class pretty much sucked. We all sucked because we needed to take the time to learn how to do it better, right? Because right. there's a lot of great dudes that came out of that school that ended up doing PWO and are still doing things to this day. Benjamin Boone, Hobo Joe, Johnny Gargano, of course. Uh, at the time, her name was Angel Dust, but now she's Zoe Sky, wrestling for Shimmer. Uh, so many good people that came out of that initial training school. Bobby Beverly. He wasn't around, so he just kind of threw this on Johnny Gargano, who was 19 and probably shouldn't have been training people, but he was still way ahead of anybody for that age. And so in a lot of ways, together, whoever would show up to training when JT wasn't there, it was like we're all learning this art together and just trying things and failing and sucking and seeing stuff on TV and like, well, maybe this will work, maybe this won't work, developing our characters. And, you know, a lot of the things that we were doing were extensions of who we were. But also, I hate, and I'm sure you've heard this in wrestling interviews, so like, well, who I am as a wrestler is just me turned up. I turned a dial up to 10 and that's me. Like that is true, right? But also I think we shouldn't say that as wrestlers as much anymore because when we do something that offends someone, then we go, well, that's just my character, right? Right. Well, right. wait a minute. What happened to the dial turned up? So it's, I like to say that like who I am is an extension of me to a, to a certain degree because a lot of my vulnerability as a real human I just wanted to tell my story, but that connected with people, you know, mm -hmm. Hey, I have cerebral palsy. I had an abusive childhood, but I endured all this to live my dream as a professional wrestler. And people connected with that. Right. But when I do things like a bad guy and I do things like back in the day when I was in absolute intense wrestling and I was feuding with Veda Scott, a woman, and I, you know, became creepily obsessed with her. Like I, that's not something that I would do to a girl in real life. And I was like stalking her. And then I beat her with a beer bottle and bloodied her. Like, you can find inspiration in movies and other things to like add to this character, but that's not who I am. You know, I think when Rikishi ran down Stone Cold Steve Austin back in uh, 2000, I don't think he, you know, Rikishi Fatu goes around, you know, doing hit and runs. Uh, that's not his thing, but it's like sometimes we have to do things that we don't do as actual human beings. What, what, what's the point of this rambling? Where was I going with all this? It, it was just like that, that came from uh, how long you were in the school for, but that, that translated into what really you were learning and developing during your yeah, time so, in the school. So a lot of that was really on the job training and like just figuring out what works for me and what doesn't, trying not to compare myself to others, which is very hard both as a wrestler in life, but one of the comparisons that I've learned along the way in finding who you are as a wrestler and as a character, I think it works for anybody as a human being, right? 
to bring out my comfortability as a performer, I had to work with characters that brought something out of me to where, like, think about any relationship you've had in your life, a friendship, uh, boyfriend, girlfriend, boyfriend, boyfriend, whatever you're into. Um, think about what you gained from that relationship, what you lost, and then when you walked away from it, what kind of person it made you, whether it was good things or bad things. You walk away from that, and there's a layer of you that gets built on after that relationship, right? And I think as a performer, like I was first thrown with Hobo Joe. Hobo Joe is a homeless character, kind of funny, right? And I remember he wanted to come out to Wu-Tang Clan ain't nothing to F with, okay? As a theme song for no reason. And, and me as a person, I think that's funny, but I'm just breaking into wrestling. I'm like, no, I want people to take me serious, okay? We cannot do this. Even though I'm a funny guy, I like stuff like that. Somewhere along the way, you know, we separate... A couple years later, we come back, we get the opportunity on PWO to be this tag team. But I've worked with different people, and I've learned some things. And now I'm like, wait a minute, maybe I could do this thing with Hobo Joe now. Maybe I could be the straight guy to Hobo's ridiculous guy. And because of Hobo Joe, I end up to finding myself in the sense that I know how to be funny now on camera as a wrestler. So after that tag team is done with Hobo Joe, now I'm comfortable because I didn't understand it before. Like, how do I be funny as a wrestler? How do I bring out this other part of my persona? Working with Hobo Joe and building that layer, leaving that relationship, it helped me be comfortable as a funny performer, right? And now I could be a singles wrestler or a bad guy and like have this layer of hilarity to me, like have the smart aleck attitude. I love the Ninja Turtle. So I like to think that Gregory Iron, much like Greg Smith, he's sort of like Raphael, right? Like, like he's kind of, uh, he's, he's got a, a trigger, yeah, you know, like a short fuse there. And uh, he can have a little bit of an attitude, kind of crude, you know, attitude. And uh, things can just set him off. And uh, he doesn't know that he's this five foot four guy with cerebral palsy sometimes, right? But again, like working with different characters and like going through life experiences as a wrestler, as this character, you leave these relationships, you leave these bouts, and you become a different person. And I think that's important in life. You know, like when I talk to talk in schools, it's like just every interaction you have with someone, it can make you a different person for the good and the bad. And we have to accept that for who we are. But now we know how to carry on through life with these new experiences and we have to adjust accordingly. Mm -hmm. That's my rambling. No, a hundred percent. I love it. And, and, and going off of that rambling, um, I will add some ramble as well. Um, I, I feel like, you know, where I've, where I've found myself um, with a lot of things when it comes to that confidence part, right. Is I feel like I almost identify those things as like, there's two different versions of confidence in us. There's like what I would call like a subconscious confidence, maybe that calloused type of confidence, right? The one that like gets built up from like, this is what we develop and what we learn from all of these different different experiences, whether it's relationships, interactions of any kind, whatever. And then you also have that like that conscious confidence, the one that we lead with, right? That's the that's the type of confidence that you can walk into a room with and be like, okay, cool, I know kind of how I need to actually be or present myself i've got it's like almost a little bit of a character right but you're like no this is i just feel good today this is how you know what it is whatever right but i also think that when that confidence lacks we forget that there's kind of that like reserve tank that we can tap into right and i say all this because i feel like i and it might be a weird way to explain it but i feel like i experienced a heavy version of that in the last like year of my life where like I built myself up to like the most confident version of me that there's ever been. Right. And I don't mean that in any other way other than just like happy version of me. Right. I, yeah. I felt like I was, you know, I, I started getting a gym routine down. I started just like focusing on so many of these other things that all kind of like creatively personal life, all this sort of stuff, like was an all encompassing positive experience. And that brought me more positive experiences. And I was like, wow, this is great. Well, then I had to realize, well, what happens when that major positive experience that was brought to me, uh, goes away. What happens when I lose that? Well, I'm not going to be walking in the room every day feeling super confident, right? right? My, my, my lead confidence, my conscious confidence, it's not going to be at a high. It's probably going to be gone because now I've lost something that's super important to me. And even though, yeah, I know that I'm doing all these good things, I'm not able to feel that way necessarily, which means I can't lead with that. But through a lot of just like self work and, and reflection and all that sort of stuff during that time, I had to remind myself of, well, 
who are you really? What what are you like? Who are you when no one else is around, right? And we're yep. not talking about the content creation, the the creation of any kind. Just like as a human being, what have you developed, right? Let's remember those things. And it's not about immediately being able to switch, uh, like flip a switch uh, into – Hey, remind yourself that you're a good person and that you have it in you to, to accomplish things. And all of a sudden you can walk in that room and you can feel fine. It's not about that at all. It's the fact that you can remind yourself, you can walk into that room still feeling really, really, really bad. But knowing that in the back of your mind, believing in yourself back there, that at some point that will stop. Yeah. Right. And I think that was like a hugely like valuable and there's probably plenty of other ways to explain that or to learn it. But individually for myself, that I feel like is how I learned that as I was like, wait, you know, I feel terrible right now, right? At the time I feel awful. This, this is terrible. I don't know how I'm going to deal with this, but through some time and some self-reflection, it was like, wait, you know, you've, you've already done the work. Like there's a good version of you there. You're, you're still good. Just because you lost something doesn't mean that your value is any less. Yeah. Right. But it was that confidence thing where again, I, I didn't have confidence that I could lead with. I had to remind myself of like, I need to tap into that, that reserve tank in the back of my mind, that calloused confidence that mm -hmm. I built up over time of like, Hey, you've experienced stuff like this before. You've been through bad days before. It's the cliche saying of like, Hey, if you're sitting here right now and you're really, really sad, remember you've got an undefeated streak against every bad day that you've experienced before. True. You've done it. Yeah. Right. You have done it and it sucks. It's terrible to go through again, but you can't. And that was the ultimate reminder for me of like, okay, I, I've built up. It's everything that you were talking about. It's like you built up things after those experiences to be able to sit. And even if in that moment you cannot lead with confidence, know that you can tap into that when the time is needed and when the time is right. And me being able to do that to, you know, my tank being almost on E, but being able to jump into that reserve tank and be like, oh, this is the thing that can push me through this. This yeah. is the thing that can continue to maybe get me back to, that confidence that I can lead with. Yes. Then, right. Yes. And I think there's such a balance there. And I don't know, did any of that make sense? Like, no, does that like, it makes perfect sense too. And it's like, I think the key word there is balance, right? Because I think in the, in the past, my mistake was when I had these issues with confidence or I lost something that I cared about, it was like, okay, dive head into wrestling. Right. Cause like, that's the biggest passion in my life, but forgetting that there are other things balance that also I love and I care about and I could focus on them too. And like, sometimes I lost sight on just responsibilities as an adult human that I should be taking care of. Right. And I think one of the things that's really helped me is self-reflection of not only the things that I've overcome and that I've endured, but also being real with myself and realizing that maybe perhaps in this situation, I made some mistakes too. And that hurts. And that sucks when you have to admit to yourself, like, I fucked up too, you know what I mean? But like, uh, for, like I'll give you a perfect example. You know, I was with a girl for five years uh, from 2012 to 2017, right? And at some point she cheated on me, okay? And didn't expect it, didn't see it coming. I think to myself, well, geez, like I'm wrestling all the time every weekend. Like I could cheat on her all the time and I was just completely loyal, would never do something like that. That's not the type of dude I am. But from the moment we started dating, she was very much more responsible with her money I found out right off the bat, like her goal is like, Hey, I'm a paralegal. I would like to save money together to maybe one day buy a house, have some kids, blah, blah, blah. And like, yeah, Hey, I want all those things too, but I don't follow the blueprint of life. I got to do this wrestling thing first. Right. Cause this is what I care about. And then somewhere along the way, when I get signed to a contract, you know, we got an influx of money, then we could do it. Right. So She's telling me, you know, you should be able to save money. And here I am like, yeah, like uh, I'm having car issues, so I'm struggling with that. But uh, I, I fixed my car. By the way, did you see this new vintage WrestleMania 5 shirt that I bought for $150? And she's kind of like, okay, what the, f what is wrong with this guy? Right? And it, it, I'm not self-aware of that at the moment. I'm just like, I need this WrestleMania 5 shirt. You know, the house will come in time. I'm like 20-some years old. I don't need a house right now. And so in retrospect, I could look back and be like, well – that was kind of selfish of me to like not think about what she wanted and just focus on, well, I'm doing this wrestling thing. It'll come when it comes. Right. And so it sucks to think because I, I'd like to think that I'm a pretty thoughtful person. And I remember, you know, I'm, I like gift giving. Right. So I go out of my way to get her certain things, but also back then 
a little bit broker. So I'm getting like the bare minimum of gifts. Like she would go out of her way to like really pay attention to the things that I liked and were interested in. And when she would get it for me, I'm like, holy cow, like you, where did you find this? Right. And I'm like, well, here's this t-shirt that I saw like uh, on a deal for $10 and like thoughtful, but like could have been more thoughtful if I didn't buy that $150 WrestleMania five t-shirt for myself. And so I say all that to say in time I grew up, you know, and I started to realize like, maybe I shouldn't, maybe I'm more selfish than I think. Right. And I should probably be thinking about, especially when you're entering a partnership, a union, uh, what this person wants and needs too. And so it's like, doesn't justify her cheating on me, but in retrospect, I could see what built up to that happening because like I wasn't fulfilling things that she needed and she didn't know how to verbalize that. And so unfortunately she acted out, but it's like, you know, I don't know what she's doing right now. I hope she's doing great, but it's one of those things where it's like, I don't want to say what if, but it's a learning experience. You know what I'm saying? Because now I'm in a situation where previous relationship I had was like the best relationship I ever had in my life. And she gave me the opportunity with my growing and changing to show myself, I guess, that I could really be a great partner. And that sort of ended suddenly. It was just one of those things where she loved and cared about me, but not in the same way that where she saw herself spending the rest of her life with me. And that hurt. Mm -hmm. And that felt like the end of the world because I, gave her my all right and I, I thought to myself like I really looked back much like I did the five-year relationship I said where did I go wrong and it was one of those things where I don't think you did anything wrong it just wasn't meant to be right but all of these moments good and bad you know they again build that layer and now Hannah that I'm with now it's like I could be the best version of me you have to go through the shit and fall down to have these life experiences that enrich you and build you up and just you have better experiences right you gotta grow up like well you gotta you gotta adult you don't have to grow up you know just be more self-aware of like other people's feelings and the things happening around you and just know that like you should divide your interests so that way you don't get lost in the sauce of this one thing that you're incredibly passionate about because i'll never stop loving wrestling the way i love it mm -hmm. but i love other things too and you balance it all goes back to balance. Like that's, yeah, that's what I'm focused on with you. Balance. No, how when you were so like when, when you start wrestling, and things get active, and like how are you keeping up balance during that time? I'm not. You so so because <laughs> and I asked that because I know you said earlier yeah. that you sort of just do like it was 100 percent just everything was wrestling. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about that a little bit. What was and this could be a handful of years. This could be a one year. So I don't know. But like walk me through, you know, because obviously I asked that question to then get to like, what was that lack of balance like? So I don't know. I think, again, the pressure of being friends with Gargano, who was so incredibly talented and is even more talented today. I don't know. I just always felt like Johnny became more of a brother than a friend. So it's like I have to I got to keep up with my brother. Right. And I learned a lot from him. I think in some ways maybe he learned stuff to, from me, even if it was what not to do. But uh, I don't know. I appreciate having someone like him in my life because it definitely – I think he sort of tried to keep me more balanced for sure. And I that's something we haven't talked about. I think it's important to always be going through the self-discovery within yourself and having self-awareness of the world around you. But also I do feel like it's – a blessing to have a positive social circle, finding those people that lift you up when you are down. Because there were situations where I was going through bad wrestling experiences, bad breakups where again, th you think it's the end of the world. I mean, I remember specifically when that five year relationship ended and like, there was like a phone conversation where like, you know, I had this moment of weakness where I'm like, well, maybe if I go talk to her in person, that's going to change something. Guess what? It doesn't it usually doesn't once someone's mind is made up and whatever. So I remember calling Johnny on the phone. And I'm being like, hey, like this just happened with me and so-and-so and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like uh, – and he's like, come to my house right now and just we'll hang out. And I remember being like, no, I think I should go to her house and talk to her. He's like, do not do that. Absolutely do not go talk to her. It's not going to change anything, dude. Please come to my house. I'm like, are you sure? Because I feel like – and he's like, nope, nope, 100%. So like finding those people in your life, like again, yeah. 
you're going to have detractors, people that do not believe in you. And usually those people that drag you down, it's because their dreams died a long time ago. And that could be their own fault because they didn't invest the time and effort in and they thought it was impossible. They listened to the lies that they were fed and they believed them, right? And that's unfortunate because going back to the beginning of our conversation, you know, why do you hate your job? You know, what can we do to change that? I think some people, I've been there myself when I started wrestling, I worked at a tool store for five years. I am, I'm not a real man. Okay. I know nothing about tools. So I hated every second of it. And, um, no matter how good my day was going at that job, once I had to walk through that door and clock in, oh, just overwhelmed with anger to the point where when I got fired, yes, I got fired, I, I didn't realize the weight that was lifted off of my shoulders. Yep. And like it, what it came down to was just laziness. I kept going back to this job because I knew I, I, it was just the devil that I knew as opposed to the devil that I didn't. And I didn't want to put forth the time and effort to find something else to support my wrestling habit because it took five years to start making money as a wrestler. But it's like to anybody who's like hating something in your life, stop doing it. Like get, get away from it. Like when I see people that like, thankfully for me, I've never been in like an abusive relationship physically, verbally. And I know it's harder. It's more challenging. I hate to say hard. It's more challenging when you're in that situation because you know your heart's involved right but like man i just can't imagine now with what i've learned like with jobs being an example going back to something day after day and be like i hate this this makes me miserable but this is the way it is like you can change it you know it might not happen overnight rome wasn't built in a day but like you have to be willing to make that change like i had to do it from a financial perspective of like like once things were over with some of my relationships where I couldn't save money or whatever. It's like, what am I doing wrong? Like, oh, I'm buying all these $100 vintage shirts. <laughs> that seems like a bad idea or, you know, not trying to learn how to cook food on my own. So I'm just eating out every day and maybe I should be more responsible with my money. And then like, man, I got to tell you, when you are actually, you have a, a, a an amount of money in the bank where you could be like, well, you know, if my car breaks down, it costs me like 400 bucks. Like there was a time like 10 years ago where it have been like, oh my God, like poof, my world is over. Where am I going to get 400 bucks? Now it's like, well, this sucks. It is 400 bucks, but it, you know, uh, I'll be okay. Right. Like that used to feel like earth shattering. Like I'm going to die now because my car is broken down again. Where were we going with all this? <laughs> <laughs> we uh we were talking about the just the the balance of all of those things between once you get active with wrestling and and balancing all of those real life things that often will pop up and get in the way and derail you so i think balance really became a thing for me um it was a slow process five years in i have this moment where because of my friendship with a guy by the name of colt cabana um, very successful wrestler, works in AEW, and a guy by the name of CM Punk. You've heard of him. Uh, <laughs> CM Punk, uh, a guy that I looked up to coming up as a wrestler, straight edge, doesn't drink, doesn't smoke. He made that cool for me because everyone I knew as a kid when my parents were drinking and smoking, I'm like, well, this is like the progression of life. I have to drink and smoke. And then I saw Punk, and he just like, was anti-everything. And I was like, oh, I don't have to drink and smoke to be cool because this dude's cool without it. Yeah. Um, I have this moment where they, they publicly endorse me on a show in Chicago. And, you know, it leads to the video going a little bit viral. I end up being in Sports Illustrated ESPN, and I can make a little bit of money as a wrestler. Again, it wasn't an overnight thing. Um, it still took some time. But I think with increased self-awareness, knowing that there's a world outside of wrestling – life experiences, but also, again, positive social circle. People that not just are in wrestling, but people that are in wrestling, but maybe like other things besides wrestling. Uh, I think that really helped create balance. And then going back and remember some of the things that like made me who I am, again, with my sense of humor, the things that I grew up watching, like Adam Sandler and Saturday Night Live. And like, again, I didn't realize it until years later. A lot of my, I have a very morbid sense of humor based on the experiences that I've been through in my life. And I think that comes out in my podcast. There's really not an outlet for me as my character to show that sense side of myself, mm -hmm. which is the great thing about the podcast. But like Norm MacDonald was like his dry, almost direct, like, I can't believe he said that to where it's like some people laugh 
and other people are like, Ooh, like, why did yeah. you say that? Like, uh, one of the things that he would always do is like, uh, the, the gimmick where he would say, uh, you know, Oh, that girl, uh, she's, uh, what's the term I'm looking for? Uh, she's a, Oh yeah. Dirty whore. Yeah. Like what he would do something like that. <laughs> like, so that I somehow subconsciously, uh, in my life, joking about the things that I went through with my mom, you know, I'd be like, oh, my mom, like, she's, uh, she's something. That's the term I'm looking for. She's a um, huge crackhead. <laughs> and, like, you know, it just makes people completely uncomfortable, right? So it's right. like that's – I don't know, man. Like, just having people in my life that remind me that, like, hey, if wrestling doesn't go the way you want it, there's other stuff out there. And, you know, wh- one of the best pieces of advice I ever got in my life was someone who now is my friend. Stone Cold Steve Austin, which is weird. It'll never stop being weird that I could say, my friend, Stone Cold Steve Austin. Oh, absolutely. When I did his podcast for the first time, I sat in his house for like six hours after. And at one point, you know, I was just starting to do motivational speaking. So this is 2018. And I was telling him, I mean, I was under the, through the producer that I met, Sean, who put me on the show. One of the things I wanted to push was this motivational speaking thing. But like, it wasn't like, completely fleshed out. I was doing it, but I hadn't really had a platform to say, Hey, I'm a motivational speaker. So I'm like, this is what I need. So I sort of was upfront with Steve afterwards. I was like, I'm not doing this as much as I want. I don't know how to navigate motivational speaking. Like I do wrestling. And it's very scary to try to do something that is not wrestling centric. And so that he shared with me a story where he said, you know, when I was coming up in wrestling, there were moments where I was doing things that maybe I shouldn't have. And when I had started traveling, there was a wrestler by the name of Paul Orndorff that I traveled with, and I really looked up to him. And at one point, he saw some of the stuff I was doing, and he just stopped me and said, Steve, you know there's more to life than wrestling, right? And he said, and so then Stone Cold Steve Austin says to me in his house, he goes, so hell, I don't know if this means anything to you, kid, but uh, coming from me, I just want you to know there's more to life than wrestling. And... I don't know if, you know, someone else would have said that if it would have resonated with me the way it did with him because it was someone that I looked up to. Mm -hmm. But when he said that, I think in 2018, that's really when it was like, okay, I think you really need to make a change because this dude who is the most popular, most financially successful professional wrestler of all time is telling me that there's more to life than wrestling. Maybe there's something to that. Maybe I should go back and explore some of the things that made me who I am that, you know, Maybe I'll always be looked at a pro, as a pro wrestler, but there's so much more to Greg than just pro wrestling. And so I had to look back and find some of those things that I loved and cared about. And I got to tell you, over the last six years, I'm much happier for exploring those other options in my life. Yeah. Well, it, it goes back to a lot of the stuff we were talking about earlier of like finding things that feed your why, finding things that feed your purpose. And it's like we, we find those things that are extensions of ourselves, right? There, there is in the same way that, like, yes, in a way that you know, playing a wrestling character, portraying somebody for that reason is an extension of somebody, or the volume turned up, right? But I think that that happens in any way. We create different extensions of ourselves in every. You know, there's a there's an extension of me that is a filmmaker. There's an extension of me that's a podcaster. There's an extension of me that's just a freelance dude who sits and hopes to close a client on a new deal that so they pay me you know what i mean and not that those are like none of those are different and i think that that's what a lot of us get wrong is that we almost rather than accepting these things as branches off of our own tree right we think that we have to create a whole different tree to begin with Mm -hmm. it's like oh well this version of me has to be like this and and it also goes back to something else we said earlier of, of the continuous thing of like who are you when no one else is around like I find great comfort in the fact that like, I know if no one else is around, I know exactly who I am. I am the same in any circumstance. I'm putting on a slightly different hat. Yeah. You know, I, I, we, you know, if we were again talking in any other circumstance, I'm probably going to be talking to you in the same way, but there's a slight podcaster voice that you put on when you do this sort of thing, right? Absolutely. Hey, I totally agree with you on that one. I agree with you on that (laughs) one right there. Um, but you know, there's like, there, there's slight things of cool. This is how you turn into this character a little bit. Now that just, that might be the way that I look at life because I did take a lot of that from pro wrestling is I think we were talking about this before we were recording. I learned marketing, branding, and storytelling from pro wrestling. Yeah. So now in my freelance creative career, like, like you, you could ask any of my creative partners, 
they're like, you know, if you were like, what is Ross's biggest creative inspiration? They would be like, oh, it's wrestling. Yeah. Because I learned so much from that. And in a weird way, I think that translates into how I've learned to navigate just life in general is, well, what version of me needs to show up for this thing? And that's not a character. That's not a facade. But it's like, do I need to be the helpful version to this person? Do I need to be a good listener version to this person? Do I need to be the leader, the advice giver of this? Or do I need to be the person who has all the ideas in this moment right now? Like, there's different ways to tap into that. And I think it also comes to something you mentioned earlier is like it is that it's building that self-awareness. Mm. It's building that. And that's such an overused term. And I think everybody in the world thinks that they're self-aware. And I think, sure, to an extent you are because you're the only one in your brain. So you know things about you that other people don't. But I don't yeah. think that that translates necessarily into self-awareness is not just like it's the balance of being both selfish and selfless at the same time. Yeah. Right. Because I think that we, when we become the most aware versions of ourselves, that often means we can become the most fulfilled versions of ourselves. And I think when you're using selfishness in that way, it allows you to become more selfless because you're more aware of what I can give to this person yep. around me. Right. Yep. I think you said something similar to that earlier of like being able to give to those around you, whether that's energy, time, whatever it is that's the ultimate power in understanding who you are. Yeah. It's yes, of course it brings benefit to you. It allows you to do the things you want to do and grow in different ways. But I think the ultimate power in connection is cool. What does that in case, like what does that um, allow me to do for other people? Yeah. So it's like, cool, I can identify, cool. I get to build this fun little platform called a podcast. Now that they become a thing that everybody wants. And I love talking to people. So cool. Maybe I can create a place and a platform that allows people to talk about things in a way that maybe they don't get to yeah. in other ways. Like I told you at the beginning of this, like, hey, man, I know we're going to talk about wrestling. But just so you know, I'm not going to sit you down and be like, uh, so what's Gargano like? Yeah, yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Like it's not going to be Piece that. Piece of garbage. Piece of garbage. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, you know, it's not going to be that thing, right? Because it comes down to, well, no my strength, my, my platform that I built this for was let's just connect and let's just talk about everything. So cool. Now, hopefully you get to leave here having a different type of conversation than maybe you've had on something else. Right. Because I know, especially when things like this can turn into like almost a, Oh yeah, cool. I'll do this for press or whatever. It becomes that question and answer sort of thing. It's like, yeah. Oh yeah. Tell me when you got started. What was your first match? Like, what was your craziest injury? Sure. Coolest par- person you met, whatever. It's like, yeah, well, cool. What are we really doing there, right? We're we're answering this kind of like uh, paint by numbers style of questions, and I think in any realm of connecting, creativity, whatever it is, uncovering why we want to do those things, and ultimately how that fulfills us, and then what version of us that needs to show up for that. I think understanding all of those things is a very vastly important and honestly very overlooked part. Of, of doing anything. Yeah. Because again, we can show up to a job that we hate, but it's like, all right, can we find even one resemblance of something that maybe we enjoy about it? Maybe it's that coworker that you get to spend some time with. Can we take something away from that? But then also if you can walk away from that terrible, you know, shitty situation, whatever it is, what different version of us can be built out of this? And yeah. then what new requirements does that new version of us need? So then maybe we're opening up some new doors when we're starting to change things up. Now I'm the one that's rambling and we have, we have went so far off. No, 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 no. I, I, I love everything you're saying. Cause you know, one thing that uh, connected with me as you were saying all that is like thinking of the idea of like, you know, we've talked a lot about in this episode about bettering ourselves, right. Mm-hmm. Trying to find the best version of ourselves and just, you know, why, who we are. And in my journey, when I originally became a wrestler, wanted to prove people wrong when I started to get success. Then the goal became, well, I'm going to get signed to WWE. That's my dream. And, you know, again, going back to that previous relationship, it was like, well, things will get better once I get signed, right? And there were so many people in my life because I don't think anybody is a self-made individual. You have people in your life that help you get to the point in which you are at right now. I always would think to myself, let's use Johnny as an example, you know, my best friend in the world. He's done so much for me. I would always think to myself internally, man, I wish I was in a better position that I could give back to Johnny to show him 
and you know, it doesn't always have to be financially, but for me, it's like, I wish I could do something for him like he's done for me just to show him like, man, I love you, dude. Like, I don't know if I'd be here if it wasn't for you. But that'll happen when I get that WWE contract, you know, and then I'm, I have all this money and like blah, blah, blah. It's like, why wait until this dream that you might not get, right? In a lot of ways, listen, if I don't get signed somewhere, I'm 36 year old, years old at this point, I've come to terms with the idea that, dude, look at yourself in the mirror. You've done so many things in 17 years that um, – J.J. Dillon once told me this in an email. I reached out to him because he had a son with cerebral palsy, and I was just looking at, uh, looking for some insight, some advice. He was the manager of the Four Horsemen, worked with Ric Flair and Arn Anderson and all those guys, and he wrote me back. He critiqued the match and watched the promo. He said, you know, I know your goal is WWE, but even if you never get to that goal, I want you to know that you have already lived a dream that most people will only continue dreaming about, and I think about that a lot try to humble myself and think like, man, you've done some wild stuff that if you would have told 15 year old Greg, you know, that you're going to be doing this, you know, teaming with the guy that inspired you to be a wrestler, Zach Gowan, sitting with Stone Cold Steve Austin, wrestling the Dudley boys, Matt Hardy and Jeff Hardy walking up to you at a wrestling show and going, Hey Greg, can we take a picture with you for social media? And and what am I? No, get away from me. Hardy boys. (laughs) Like, uh, you know, he would freak out if he knew this was a real thing. So, I say all that to say, you know, why wait until that one specific thing that you're looking for? Maybe they're, maybe the things that you're doing as you're moving forward are going to take you in a direction that perhaps maybe you didn't know that you'd be into, right? And you can better yourself right now. And I tell you, over the last six years, being able to give back to someone like Johnny that I consider family, doing stuff for his mom, who in a lot of ways became my mom, being able to do stuff for and with his son now, who is basically my nephew, Quill, like it's the coolest thing I've ever done, right? And it it started with trying to be a better version of me, a more responsible version of me, but still holding on to those things that, you know, I grasped onto as a kid. Like I I, I told him after the first time I went to Disney with him, because, you know, Johnny's a big Disney guy. I'm a big Disney guy. We're giant kids. One of the first things that we bonded on as friends were through wrestling. He found out I like Ninja Turtles. We started talking about like the karate kid. And at this time it's like 2006. And, you know, I think I had been around enough people where it's like, well, you got to start growing up. You can't like these things. But Johnny was totally into these things. So I was like, oh man, like I really am hitting it off with this guy. This is okay. When I went to Disney, uh, I was walking through the park and I saw you know, a dude dressed up as Launchpad from DuckTales. And I got to tell you, dude, I had a feeling of happiness in my heart that I was like, I did not know seeing a grown man in a costume like this would bring so much joy and happiness to my life, but it does. And I think that this kind of all goes back to, you know, if it makes you happy, do it. You know, like if that's the thing that makes you feel special, you know, I don't have to be Launchpad in that costume, right? Like, I could just see Launchpad, and, like, it brings me a level of fulfillment. I think we as humans are always chasing this idea of, like, what is the meaning of life? What is our purpose? I don't have a special in on the situation, but I'd like to think, based on my life experience, that it's pretty simple. Happiness and laughter. You find the things that Fulfill those things in your heart and in your mind, just the ability to make you, uh, you know, that involuntary reaction where, you know, you can't stop smiling. Like if you find things that make you do that, that's the, that's the meaning of life. Like it's not money. Money helps. Like if, you know, people that say like, oh, money doesn't buy happiness or they probably never had money. Having a little bit definitely helps. Not struggling from week to week, a great thing. But like if you can find things that you're passionate about that make you happy and just, create laughter for yourself and those that you care about that is the true meaning of life and that's what i try to strive for and look for every single day of my life now so you know we've talked so much about growth and development all this sort of stuff along your story through this through this episode sitting here today when you look forward like i don't want it to be the cliche like what's next question as like oh what are your next like five-year goals but like when you do look forward, being this version of you now, how do things look when you do look forward? Just overall optimistic. Like I don't know where 
my life is going to take me now. I have ideas. Like I've been working on a book. I took some time away from wrestling because, you know, unfortunately, even though we didn't have the best relationship, my dad passed away back in December. And I kind of knew it was coming. And, uh, you know, he had cancer and um, someone who was so out of touch with his emotions. It was weird seeing him try to find that. And I wish he would have found it sooner. Um, I spent some time away from wrestling just to sort of deal with that, rekindle my connection with my brothers. Cause again, that's something else I lost along the way trying to be a wrestler. I sort of misinterpreted some of the things that they would say or do because of my wrestling as like, well, you don't understand what I'm trying to do, you know? So like, I just, I, I wouldn't share all my wrestling stuff with them just because I felt like you don't get it anyways. And so I just sort of distanced myself from my brothers and there was this moment when he passed away, you know, me and my brother, my brother Mike's a cop now. Zach also wrestles, and um, he also had a part-time gig. And there was this moment, you know, when he passed, me and my brother were together, and we had to break it to my brother Zach. And so he's the youngest, and he had the closest relationship with my dad. So for him, you know, it wasn't just a dad. He had a different experience than me and my brother, because me and my brother, 10 years older, we had to deal with the the shit with him and my mom right he was just kind of alone with my dad and it was like their best friends and so we had to have this moment where uh the job that my brother works at currently um sometimes people are throwing garbage on the ground in the parking lot and he gets pissed off about it right so we showed up to his job and you know us being us we get out of the car we start throwing stuff on the ground right and we just found out my dad died and and uh zach's sitting in this vehicle and he's like, why are you guys doing this? Why are you he's like, come pick this up, get out of the car, get out of the car. We walked up to the car and we're like, get out of the car. And he wouldn't get out. And I think he knew why we were there because it was like nine o'clock at night. And uh, he finally gets out of the car and my brother just breaks down and goes, dad's gone. And uh, we had this moment. It's like drizzling uh, down on us and we're hugging. And uh, of course, I break the sadness by going, I hate that I'm the oldest and the shortest out of all three of us. And then we start laughing and just like, um, I don't know, we got to rekindle. We've been rekindling that brotherhood, right, that I think we sort of lost along the way. Um, sort of getting back on track here, though, it's like, I don't know where life's going to take me. You know, I didn't expect you know, this time a year ago that my dad was going to die and how I was going to feel about that. I, you know, it's like affected me in ways I, I didn't expect, even though we didn't have the greatest relationship, like I'll hear a song and I'll just like break down. Right. And, uh, I've been writing a book too, while I've taken this break from wrestling, it's something I wanted to do for a long time. And I ha sort of hated myself for a while for not doing it sooner, but also boy, if I would have wrote a book five years ago, it'd be different than what I'm writing right now. So the fact that I'm writing it right now, that's exactly how it was supposed to be, right? And this book, I think in a lot of ways, I've been trying to write it so it's like not exactly for uh, elementary school kids, but I think an elementary school kid can read up. You know, I think it's like middle school and up, but also, you know, it can resonate with adults and my wrestling audience. So I had to find the perfect way to write this book to where it's like, you know, it's something that I could use in schools for motivational speaking, but also the current audience that's there, they can relate to what I'm saying. I didn't know I was going to be writing a book, right? It just sort of happened. And, you know, I have had the opportunity over the last couple of years and it always falls through to maybe write for WWE, right? That could be something that's in my future, right? Which I'm okay with. Like, if I don't have to bump as much, that's cool, right? But also, if I were to get a job wrestling, that's sweet too, right? Uh, I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. But I do know that as long as I'm doing things that make me happy and healthy and just if I'm laughing, it's going to be okay. And somewhere, I'm going to stumble into something, whether or not I realized it or not. I'm going to stumble into something that keeps making me the most happy and fulfilled version of myself. And I think that's what really matters. And that's, I feel so strange saying that because it used to be wrestling, wrestling, wrestling. And now like me and my brother are working on this house that we own and 
I feel weird being like, well, you know, I think we should put like a floating fireplace in the living room and like maybe we should paint the kitchen light blue. And it's it, like, it feels very grown up. Yeah. And I kind of hate it, but like, I guess that's part of life, right? And it makes me happy. So I'm going to keep doing it. Yeah. No, 100%. I think that's the fun part about even though it's challenging and I mean, there's, there's weird challenges that, like I'm experiencing. Cause I don't know. I don't know what happens when you turn 30, but all of a sudden just different things start happening that you have to like, but also a lot of the same. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's this weird thing where I'm like, there's like different things where I'm like, Oh, I'm kind of looking at life in these ways now. And like, mm. it, it, it did kind of just like flip a switch where all of a sudden I was like, Oh, I'm 30 now. And I don't necessarily care about that at all. But like, there's like these, like, strange like back of my mind thoughts of like oh well this would be nice and that would be nice but at the same time i'm still like again living the life of a self-employed person it's like i wake up when i want to i go to sleep when i want to mm -hmm. i can watch as much wrestling as i feel like or miss out on whatever and, hashtag you know, blessed <laughs> and like it's like those sort of things that are like i feel like the most disciplined adult but also the most just like free roaming child at the same time. And sometimes those things are combative mm -hmm. because I feel like I should be more or less of the other. But I think again, so much of like what we, you know, we've been talking about is just like, it does come down to that freedom of like understanding exactly who you are and what you want to be and being able to go with that flow. Like that's the cool thing of you explaining all of those things of like, yeah, I didn't really think that I'd be excited about uh, redeveloping a house or I also didn't really think that I'd be writing a book. And I also didn't think that all of this stuff wouldn't be fully encompassed by wrestling. Yeah. And I think that is like the cool thing is like when we do find out like, again, it's the branches off a tree. Just because you're writing a book that isn't for wrestling fans, what, that doesn't mean you're turning your back on wrestling at all. You know what I mean? It's like we, we understand, we learn how to like, make these things a part of us. And I think that like in a weird, almost like transformer type way, you kind of collect all these bits and pieces and parts and they effectively become you. Yeah. Right. So it's like, it's still there and we still get to do these sort of things. It goes back to like the different versions of ourselves. It's like, it's not that we're putting on a mask. It's just that we're like tapping into a slightly different part of ourselves. And to make a wrestling analogy, you know, a heel and a face, you know what I mean? It's like, you can tap into both of those sides. Mm -hmm. You can understand, like, well, I wouldn't really do this, but, I mean, the character is a bad guy. Mm -hmm. Sure would. 100%. And in the same way, that, like, I might not be this most heroic person ever, but for the reasons of my character being a face, I need to stand up in this way and maybe say these things. Like, yeah. it's, it's all of that sort of stuff of, like, that, I think, is, like, the turning of the dial, right? That is the finding the extension of yourself. And it's funny because, like, I also feel like we could make a whole other hour of this show talking about the... Uh, polarities and, and comparisons and parallels of just pro wrestling and, and real life in general. And mm -hmm. just like how all of it is so just like, and, and how I have personally used so much, not even just in the creative realm, but just like so much stuff from being a fan of pro wrestling and how that has shaped my real life yeah. of how to engage in situations or how to manage a situation or even just one simple thing that a wrestler, you know, at the beginning of this when you know, the whole like Hogan thing of eat your vitamins, say your prayer, you know, all that sort of stuff. Literally from a young age, uh, one of the things that I remember on a Hardy Boys uh, home video was they were all about dare to dream and exist to inspire. Those mm -hmm. are two things. And like literally from that age, those things were ingrained into my brain. Half because I just thought the Hardy Boys were the coolest people ever. Sure. But also, as I grew and reshaped and reformed as an adult, those things were still ingrained in my brain of like, well, what shape does that take now? Then it was, oh, well, it's the Hardy Boys and I love them and they're awesome and that's a really cool saying and it must mean something cool. Yeah. As an adult, that takes a different shape. That mm -hmm. takes a different form, right? Just like in any of the, any motto that anybody could have said in the wrestling world forever. It's like, oh, yeah, it's this on the surface. Yeah, that's what they're saying. But what it's shaped into for me is this. Like, I literally have a, a, a flag uh, hanging in the bathroom that says exist to inspire. And, you know, it's like, yeah. it's like that has stuck with me if, through anything and everything. Yeah. And I think, again, like, so bringing it back, like, that's the point. And that's, like, the, the coolest thing to hear you say all these things is – we are like the collections of all of our experiences. We are the collections of all of our ideas and our relationships and all this sort of stuff. And 
it's super easy to overlook that in the moment. It's super easy to be like, well, cool, that's a great saying, but right now I'm struggling to pay my bills, or right now I'm not fulfilled, or right now I'm not happy, or whatever. And it's like, I think that is like so much of the importance that I feel like we've we've talked about so much in this episode is always remembering to how does this come back to who I really am? Yeah. How does this connect to who I am at my core? Does this fulfill me in some certain way? Maybe it's a little bit, maybe it's a lot. But when we can find out how these things are extensions of who we really are, that I think is the most important part. Yeah. Whether it is looking at wrestling or movies or a motto that someone said at some point. And so it's like I always get excited when I hear somebody talking about these things where it's not just like, hey, I niched down super hard. I was this thing. And of course, we're going to have moments of that where, yes, you're going to focus on that being your sole thing. But when you can sit and you're like, yeah, I want to write a book and I want to redevelop a house and I'm building new relationships and better relationships and I'm sure there's going to be other things that are going to pop up. And it's, it's, it's figuring out where that new bar is, where that new standard is, but more so being open for those experiences that those things are going to bring, thus knowing that's going to shape us in some new way. Yeah. Even if it's the worst of experiences. And trust me, there are things that like I have experienced that I'm actively dealing with right now that I'm like... I sure wish I didn't have to deal with this. I sure wish I didn't have to feel this thing at all. But the only thing I'm trying to tap into is that callous confidence in the back of my mind of we've been through it before. We've experienced these things before. You are ready and equipped to deal with this, even if it hurts really bad. And at some point, you'll get to look at this experience and it's going to be a new piece that is added to you of now something new that you know that you can carry into the future things. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, the most important thing you learn as a wrestler is how to fall, right? And obviously that's a physical thing. You enter the school, you have to know how to fall on your upper back and brace the whole blow by extending your arms and taking as much as you can on the top of your back. You learn to fall, and then when you, especially when you're a heel wrestler, a bad guy, you have to learn how to do a bump and feed. So it's, you know, you bump and you have to get up as quick as can as you can so you take another clothesline or a back elbow or whatever. Learning to fall, I think figuratively, is the best thing we can do as humans using this wrestling analogy because things are good right now. We're enjoying this conversation. It's a great podcast. I'm overjoyed that we got to do this finally. At some point, I'm going to fall, right? Right now, I'm on the comeback. You know, I'm rocking and reeling. I, I got the crowd on their feet. But at some point, someone's going to cut me off. And I'm going to have to take a bump, right? But I've got to be able to feed back up as quickly as possible and just keep going. And that doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. I might have taken uh, – I might not have fell as, as, as comfortably as I would have liked to, right? Maybe it hurts a little bit more than usual. But I got to fall and get back up and fall and get back up because – that's what we got to do. We can't let it keep us down for too long because like, it doesn't matter how good things are going. You are going to fall again. But as long as you know that's going to happen, you're going to have your downs just as much as you're going to have your ups. You're going to be okay. You just got to get through those bumps. Keep going. Bump and get back up. I have been waiting a very long time on this show for someone to use some wrestling analogies on this show. And then <laughs> you know what? And we finally have gotten to this point. There it is. Last handful of questions for you, yeah, and then we can wrap this up because I I do know one hundred percent this could be like a four hour conversation, one hundred percent. Um, I know you have shared versions of this already, but if we were to kind of all encompass the thought or feeling when you look back at your entire journey and whether it deals with wrestling or just like life in general, what do you feel like the biggest lesson that you've learned has been from any of that? just to give back, you know, to share the things that you've gone through, you know, who you are, because again, you don't know how sharing that information will impact someone else. You know, like I became a wrestler, whether it was, it was probably more subconscious than anything else because of the way these wrestlers made me feel in times when I felt my weakest, when I was going through my worst, right? But when I look in the mirror, I'm not Hulk Hogan or Stone Cold or Chris Jericho or Shawn Michaels. I'm Greg, right? I'm just me. I'm just a dude when I look in the mirror. But that doesn't mean I don't mean something 
to someone. And just because I'm not in WWE or Impact or AEW, that doesn't mean someone hasn't seen what I've done and said, whoa, this has just changed my perspective completely. And I truly feel like when you change your perspective, the world shifts around you. You know, it's like the glass half empty, half full. How are you looking at it? You got to change your perspective sometimes. So I still think I'm a dude. But if someone finds something special in what I do, if someone finds some sort of inspiration to do something that they feel is bigger than themselves or to try something that perhaps maybe they wouldn't have tried before, then who am I to say, well, I'm just a dude, right? I'll keep saying I'm a dude, but if you find inspiration in what I do, then more power to you, man, because I want you to be the best version of yourself. So to be able to give all of myself and just be true about it, I think that's the biggest lesson that I've learned from because like, it's made me more fulfilled than any contract, any amount of money, just to be able to share something with someone and then hear their story back and then hear their successes. Like that's the best payment I can get, you know, like some of the kids that I've talked to at school is to come back to me and like, hey, you said this, this, and this, and this resonated with me and this helped me change my life for the better. It's like, wow. Like, I, and again, when I became a wrestler, that was not the goal. I'd like to tell you that, yeah, the goal is to inspire a bunch of people and change lives. But in reality, it was like, nope, I just want to be able to look at my dad and all those people that weren't my friend to go, hey, guess what? Fuck you. I did it. Ha ha. I, that's not the best part. The best part is literally changing lives in ways that you never thought were even possible and being something to someone that you still might not even believe you are yourself. But again, it comes down to you don't even have to be on a platform to be something special to change someone's lives. Like know that, you know, I've lost a couple of friends to suicide and, 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 and deaths and stuff. And it's just one of those things where it's like, man, I just, I wish that person knew, really knew what they meant to me. And, and just if they would have shared what they were going through, perhaps maybe that could have made a difference. You know, it's just, um, you are special to someone no matter what you're doing, who you are, your situation, someone loves and cares about you, whether you believe it or not. So just be yourself, put yourself out there and just keep going. That's all we can do. I love it. So I have a random question for you. Yep. Something new I've been doing here on the show is I've been having my previous guest give me a question to ask the next guest. Okay. Now what's funny is I did look at this question earlier. So I was like, all right, a little refresher here. What, what is the question? And it's very funny because this is, you know, a lot of this podcast centers around a story of pro wrestling. And conveniently enough, this question uh, involves a phrase that is very, very overused in the world of professional wrestling. Okay. But I would love to see how you're going to answer it from a personal perspective. Because okay. the question is, what do you feel like you are the best in the world at? And now, of course, it, of course, timed out. Again, with a pro wrestling themed yep. episode of the show. Sure. And everyone calls themselves the best in the world mm -hmm. at pro wrestling. But I would love to, of course, let's peel back that curtain. What do you as a human being feel like you are the best in your world at? Looking dumb. Setting myself up to look dumb because I, I like a good bit. And I like to think that in some ways, Greg the person... I like to, I guess in my head, like maybe I'm like the zany next door neighbor that comes in the frame during, the show, hey guys, what's going on? And then something dumb happens to me where I look like a moron. I found that I really like that in wrestling, but it's only because I really like it in real life. I like to do and, and say things that I'm hoping someone around me will say like, see how dumb what I said was. And then they'd be like, uh, that doesn't make any sense. I'm like, Oh gosh. Yeah, you're right. Oh, son of a bitch. And so like, I, I think that's probably what I think I'm the best at, yeah. at, at least with the people that are in my life currently. So yeah, if it makes someone smile and I could just look like a jackass, uh, that's really what I'm all about. And just, uh, and you know what, if no one else smiles and I just laugh at it myself, that's okay too. Because yeah. sometimes I could be my own biggest fan. I love it. The mm -hmm. humility part. Yeah. yeah. No, I absolutely love that. Yep. Um, I will – does anything come to mind that you want to ask my next guest that you want to leave me with? If not, after we record and it comes to mind, we can jot it down. But does something pop up right now? 
Um, when's the first time you kissed another human being? The first, their first kiss. Yeah, Love yeah, it. yeah. Because uh, I didn't, I didn't kiss a girl till I was eighteen. Interesting. And that's okay. because yeah. you know, the, I could have happened like maybe fourteen or fifteen. There was a girl across the street from me, uh, Jonna Hearn. Shout out to Jonna if she's watching. And uh, I'm pretty sure she would have kissed me on the lips. And I remember her going, uh, specifically saying, like, oh, you want to hang out sometime? And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, I want to hang out sometime. Like, I'm trying to figure out this whole kissing a girl of thing. Course. And so uh, I'm like, yeah, sure. And she's like, okay, well, what are you doing Monday? Monday night. And I'm like, I do something with my family on Mondays. I can't, yeah, I'm I really can't, busy Monday can't nights. hang out. And she's like, oh, well, that's unfortunate. Well, you know, are you free on, like, a Thursday night? And I'm like. Uh, Mondays no, 9 to 11, Thursdays 8 to 10. I'm pretty busy. Uh, my happy. family just really likes to bond with me in the <laughs> evenings on Monday and Thursday specifically. <laughs> so uh, I didn't end up kissing a girl until I was 18. So. Uh, amazing. Yeah. I will also say that I think there was a lot of things that I missed out on as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, because either Thursday or for a while at some point, Friday nights became the... And of course, Friday nights when you're getting older, yeah. everyone's like, what are we doing on Friday? And I'm like, I'm so busy. I uh-huh. got to see what Batista system yes yes <laughs> but you know you know what I, I'll, I'll end it with this though i'm weird okay but you know perhaps maybe i didn't get to kiss a girl because of my weirdness to have to watch every single episode of raw and smackdown every week but i think as an adult now the things that made me weird also made me successful so i think you need to embrace the things that are weird about you right now because it sets you apart who the hell wants to be like everybody else? Just be weird because that's that's life. You'll be your best self if you're just weird as F. A million percent. So another new thing I've been doing on the show is I've been giving the guest a shot at putting me in the hot seat. Is there a question that you want to ask me? I've been asking you all the questions this entire episode. Does something come to mind as we sit here and literally get to know each other for the very first time? Yeah. Um, so something you want to toss my way. This is now your show. Why didn't you get into wrestling? You you said you said that you know it became realistic you know pro wrestling Ohio close to home, why? I why not? Absolutely love that question because of course no one has ever asked me that because mm-hmm. not a lot of people are aware of that. I there's two reasons. One of them is a regretful reason. The other is a just natural flow of life reason. So one of them is the older I got, I got into those teenage years. I definitely, and I don't do this now, and it's so strange, but I definitely let the thoughts of those around me dictate whether or not I was going to make that decision. Because there's what there was a friend of mine in school. I had like two pro wrestling friends in school. Like there wasn't there wasn't a lot of wrestling fans in my school. Mm-hmm. Um, but those two, one was like just a casual watcher, but really liked it. The other was our plan when we turned eighteen was to go to OVW. Okay. That was our plan. Yeah. And uh, he was also like the one he and I, we would backyard wrestle. His dad uh, was a part of the carnival circuit. He had access and actually got us a pro wrestling ring. So we had a ring. Oh, wow. Uh, We didn't, when I say backyard wrestling, I don't mean the like hardcore style, like that wild. Like we just had a ring in his backyard and we took it like ultra seriously. So we would go bait. We would like do the classic like the hardy boy story right like we would train ourselves we sure. would try and figure out like we would watch all the all the videos all the movies all that sort of stuff and try to learn the right way of like all right well how are they doing we would run ourselves through if we would see them anyone training on like how to bump how to do all this sort of stuff we would be like all right let's go train ourselves on how to somewhat properly do that yeah in the moment, I think, you know, we definitely were like, hey, we got, all right, we're like not bad. I'm sure if I was able to see it now, I'd be like, man, you guys are insane. Uh-huh. Yep. But we we took such a serious approach to it of like, how do we do this safely? How do we do it in a cool way, obviously? And of course, how do we have fun, right? So I did the whole backyard wrestling thing for a couple years. What was your name? What was my name? That's a really good question. I remember I had a one character named Venom, really original. <laughs> Um, and then at some point I just started once, once I got out of the, like, oh, I have to have a, 
a character that's like Sting, and I'll call him Venom, I guess. Um, <laughs> then I just started going by my last name, which was Tyson. Which, okay. of course, I mean, a competition with Mike Tyson would have been pretty yeah, difficult yeah, yeah. to I, brand for, that, right? Before you continue, I, we literally just had this conversation last night, me and my buddy Alex Daniels coming back from a show in Buffalo. Uh, he was he reminded me of a promo I cut on a guy one time that just sucked. His name, not the promo, but the guy sucked. His name was Inferno. Okay? Incredible. And... Uh, you know, because it just reminded me of like a backyard wrestling. Because when you come up with a backyard wrestling, it's just it's shit. It's all it's never good. No. And so, because like my backyard wrestling was Gregberg. Love that. Like Goldberg, yes. but Gregberg. And Incredible. instead of who's next, I said who's first. Incredible. Real creative. Yep, yep. So anyway, so I hated this guy Inferno. He sucked. I had to wrestle a match against him. And so I'm a, being a bad guy. So I get on the mic and I go, Inferno, real original name. What was rage and chaos taken? And we were just laughing because, like, the worst names possible. So, Venom. Uh, yeah, 100%. That was the original. Because, like, uh, we also used to, like, before we ended up getting the ring in his backyard, we, like, my grandma's basement was just, like, this huge, like, finished. It was essentially a second house in her basement. Um, but that included big couches. And for, like, a small, like, 8-year-old, 9-year-old, 10-year-old person, mm-hmm. I was like, this is a whole ring. Yeah. This is incredible. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's yeah, though that's how that character evolved. But anyway, we take we would take it super seriously, as seriously as you could as a I don't know, twelve, thirteen year old kid, whatever. So that was our plan. And then like I said, two things happened. One, I like he and I grew apart, and the other friends that I like started becoming friends with, it's not I'm not saying that they were like negative or anything like that. And we didn't have conversations but they were like, Pro wrestling is stupid. It was just me growing up as a teenager, I was like, I still really like this thing, but I don't know if I like want it in the same way, right? Mm. I, I want these other things. I finally kissed a girl. I'm hanging out with friends now. I'm, you know, doing all this sort of stuff. Um, and just like experiencing life, right? Like what, it, what does it mean to grow up? And I also, in the back of my mind, always knew that like I did want a career in the world of creative. I did want to lean into filmmaking. I did want to lean into some form of you know multimedia kind of production, all that sort of stuff. I knew I didn't want to go to school, so I didn't go to college. And so what ended up taking over life for me was the music industry. Because for a handful of years, I worked pretty heavily in the music industry. Okay. And that was where I got a lot of my reps in when it comes to video and photo and all that sort of stuff was I was doing a lot of that stuff, marketing and branding for bands. And so that was kind of like the mix of it where it's like, as soon as I hit that 18, you know, mark, I definitely, I was like, do, am I, do I want to do this? Right. But I also like, I had zero money mm-hmm. and also I just wasn't confident in myself as a person. So I wasn't confident enough to make that decision uh, whether fortunately or unfortunately, who knows yeah. who's to say, right? Um, to you know, take that leap, go to OVW and and see what would have happened, right? Yeah. And as the years went on, I just got deeper into creative work, deeper into the music industry, and that was like still loved wrestling and would watch it all the time, and again was inspired by it at every turn. But I was like, oh, this is this is the world that I now live in, and it's funny that now. Again, one of the things that pop, that has popped up as a 30-year-old is I'm like, is that a thing? That Because it, it it's funny because it's not just – and I don't know if you could tell just by a little bit of our conversation, but it's not just – like the reason I feel like it's so important to me on different levels is that it's not just fandom. Like I genuinely believe – and maybe this is really stupid to say because I didn't enter myself into the world, right? I am an outsider. I am just a fan. Um, but it's funny because like, if you were to ask me the same question that JT asked you of like, is pro wrestling in your heart? The really weird answer is that I would say yes. Yeah. Like it it really, really is. It's not just, Oh, can I flip on the TV, watch it, catch it, love a match, you know, whatever, be the casual viewer. Again, it is like, it's weird because like I pro wrestling engulfed so much of my life, but it took like this different form. Right. And now as I look back on all those years, I'm not like, oh, my God, I should have did this. And I why didn't I do that? Yeah. But it is a thing where I'm like, I almost ask myself, I'm like, why is it still so important to me? Right. Like, why do I genuinely love it so much and care about it so much to the point where like, yeah, I mean, the Internet exists now. So everybody's a a smart fan, quote unquote. Right. Everybody has all the information for everything and dives into everything. But it's like. I would say nine and a half out of the 10 podcasts I listen to are all wrestling podcasts. Mm -hmm. 
it's all listening to every story. I'm, I'm sure you've listened to like a lot of Conrad shows or at least familiar with them. That's pretty much all I listen to. Exactly. That is pretty much my like, that's, that's everything, right? Yeah. If, if somebody releases a new doc, Debbie releases a new doc or whatever, I'm like, I love this, right? Mm-hmm. Because I have it, you know, as I matured and grew up and learned how just the world works, I became even more interested in who are the human beings behind these characters right what are their stories but to be fair even as a kid i still was like i want to learn what the hardys like actually did and who Mm. they really were that led them yeah to this thing right and so that's the strange thing is like i you know why i didn't do it is i feel like life took these different paths that i just didn't resist necessarily nor that i know if i had to right but i definitely just sort of like got into that flow of life where I was like, all right, I'm doing these other things now. And I, I feel like the love for pro wrestling took a different form, but I would be lying to you if I said it didn't often cross my mind still to this day of what would it have been like if, well, I want to let you know that it's never too late. We've all heard the stories, you know, DDP was in his thirties when he started it. And, you know, David Arquette rewrote his story with, you know, how he came back to wrestling to sort of prove that he loved and was passionate about despite Mm -hmm. his reputation for being, you know, quote unquote, the worst WCW champion ever. Something that was kind of thrust upon him to promote a movie. Exactly. Um, It's never too late Mm -hmm. to do those things. But also, you know, when you say wrestling is in your heart, just because you didn't pursue it, you know, it's not your fault because you mentioned earlier, you know, you sort of. There was a point in time where maybe you don't do it now, but you believe the lies that people told you. Like, maybe it's not possible. This is stupid. Do something else. I'm sure I can't think of something specific off the top of my head right now, but I've definitely had that happen to me in my life, mm-hmm. you know? And that doesn't mean you love that thing any less. Like you said, it took on a different meaning in your life. It's like um, music, you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, in terms of. Um, you could hear it one moment and you feel a certain way and you're just hearing it, but then something happens in your life and now you hear that same thing and you're feeling it, right? Like it's it because of circumstances in your life and stuff and uh, just uh, it's never too late, right? Mm-hmm. Like you're, you're on this journey and you love wrestling. You'll never stop loving wrestling. You just have to love it in a different way. And like, you know, I'll never stop loving wrestling. And if I have to stop taking bumps at some point, I'm, it's never going to change my love of wrestling. It did so much for me that I didn't even realize, like even, you know, you talked about, you know, a a lot of artistic things that inspired you through wrestling. Like I think a lot of my vocabulary came from professional wrestling, hearing, you know, announcers say like, this man is bleeding profusely. You know what I'm saying? Like, like things like that, or like, this is the culmination of everything. And so like, I liked reading in general, but hearing these bigger three and four syllable words. I'm like, Oh, what does that mean? And like, now they're like in my vocab in everyday life because I'm hearing Jim Ross and gorilla monsoon. I, as a kid, I literally thought the technical term for stomach was bread basket. <laughs> so when I was playing with my action figures, I'd be like, Oh, hit him in the bread basket. That's <laughs> the technical term, you know? So that's the medical term. Yeah. So I don't know, man, like uh, just, just because you're not in wrestling doesn't mean you can't love it any less than someone that is. Yeah. Yeah. No. And, and I appreciate hearing all that. And, and, you know, even hearing you explain, you know even if you begin to take less bumps stop taking bumps get out of the ring in general whatever it is that's another way that i've looked at like maybe and and who knows what's going to happen but i'm like i'm very open to the possibility that like my possibly my work in the pro wrestling world has yet to happen because all of this other stuff that i've been collecting skill wise of being able to write stories being able to really understand a lot of like how pro- what production goes into things. I'm like, okay, maybe these like this new form of me that like has uh, that I've taken on, maybe that's the thing. Maybe that's the thing that I get connected with pro wrestling with, right? Because again, as I've become an adult, matured, and you know, done all of this stuff that I've done, I have been looking like something that I would say is on my bucket list. Is I'm like, I need something in my life that officially connects me with pro wrestling. Mm-hmm. Like that, and it can be a behind the scenes thing. It could be a, who knows, maybe somebody at some point watches one of my podcasts, like that guy has a podcast voice, doesn't he? He could be an announcer. He could be a manager. He could be, it's like, you never know those sort of things. I'm like, I am super open to those things. And maybe the form of that love for pro wrestling does not take, Hey, you jumped in the ring when you were 18 years old and you've been learning and grinding it on the Indies ever since. And you've been doing all this sort of stuff and who knows, you know, what happened. Maybe it was just this like roundabout path of, 
you're doing all these other things in filmmaking and you know how to work a camera, and you know how to be in front of a camera, and you know how to write things, and you know how to rewrite someone's dialogue to make it sound. And again, you're forming all of those skills also based off of the inspiration of pro wrestling the entire time. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, it's funny to say, and I'm sure if the wrong person heard this, they'd be like, dude, shut the fuck up. You're just a, <laughs> you, you know, you're a fan or, you know. Uh, but like, I genuinely feel like today, this moment, I could walk into a wrestling company and be like, I know what to do. Yeah. Not perfectly from the business standpoint, sure. but I'm like, I know why this as a production sense doesn't make any sense. I know you saying that line in that way doesn't totally make sense. And it's because it's not, it's not me sitting and being like, I know everything about pro wrestling. It's that I've learned all these skills in all these other ways, always with my root that I connect it back to being pro wrestling. So I'm like, I could walk someone through a promo. Yeah. I, I I could I could walk somebody through well how does this story over the next three months play out because here's how it does and does not make sense both for me as a fan looking at it and also just me as like a storyteller and a writer looking at it right Vic Joseph who now does commentary for yeah. WWE NXT one of my closest friends he has a background in like sports and he was doing commentary for the Cavs and the Browns before he got into wrestling. In 2009, he sent an email to Pro Wrestling Ohio and with his legitimate credentials and the promoter being the sort of dumbass that he was, he, he saw, who the hell is this guy? He doesn't even have a wrestling background. Screw him. And I remember me and Gargano, because we had kind of a say some things, we were like, he has a legitimate sports background. Like, maybe just give him a shot. I mean, he's not going to get any money, so just, like, let him try. And he didn't know anything about wrestling, but he knew stuff from, about actual production actual broadcasting and over time he started developing his skills in pwo he developed them more by working with tommy tommy dreamer for his promotion and then he got that in with wwe and like obviously he didn't know everything about how wwe produces their announcers and everything but he learned you know what i mean like he's a sponge and now i think he's one of their biggest assets and he's been there for like four or five years at this point but again like he just came into it as a fan. And also, if you stop being a fan, once you get into this industry, like there's something wrong with you. I think I'm still the biggest fanboy. Like again, like right. I-, I could text Stone Cold and make fun of him right now, but I'm like, why is this a real thing that I could do? Yeah, exactly. I'm a fan. A hundred. Doesn't make any sense. No, all of that uh, yeah, no, it, it it totally makes sense and I get what you're saying for sure. Um and I love that. I definitely love that. And yeah, that's I think what it's 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 still something that's there. It's still something that I'm like, what form does this take? And, and I want it to take some shape in some form at some point. Yeah. Um, but before we wrap this up, I have one final question for you. Okay. I end every one of these episodes with the exact same question. So now it's your turn. So right now, I want you to pretend like everyone in the world is listening to you speak right now. We're throwing logic out the window. Okay. They can hear you. They can understand you, right? So you have a live mic attached to everything everyone everywhere and you get to share one thing with them oh geez the pressure is on what is it that you're telling them and what would you want them to hear oh my god um geez um i guess i would go hey um i guess i'm broadcasting this to every human in the world so i should probably say something somewhat emotionally fulfilling so your life might suck right now but um it's not gonna suck forever so keep going i don't know if that helps but endure and keep going Thank you. And everybody erupts in applause. <laughs> and then, and then when they do, or if they don't, I go leave high football rules. <laughs> and then, they, all right, <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay, for... Greg, dude, I am so stoked that we made this happen. Same, man. It again, it's been a long time coming in many forms. I am very, very stoked to have had you on the show, um, and to get to know you in this way. I really do appreciate like sitting down and and like getting your time in yeah. this way. No, thanks is, for making time for me. Yeah, it has been an absolute blast. Um, before we officially wrap up, anything you want people to go check out? The plugs and promotions time of the show. What do you want them to go seek out? 
Uh, you can find me on social media. I'm at Gregory Iron on Twitter, at Gregory underscore Iron on Instagram. I'm on Facebook as well. Just search facebook.com slash the handicapped hero. You can buy t shirts for me at prowrestlingtees.com slash Gregory Iron. You can, of course, listen to my podcast every single Wednesday, Iron on Wrestling. It's available on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you download podcasts. Or you can invest in the Patreon, patreon.com slash Iron Wrestling, where we do a buttload of bonus content starting at just $3. And I'll follow you back on social media if that means anything to you. Like, you know, I sometimes communicate with people on Patreon more than my actual family and friends, which is <laughs> crazy. But they've also become my family and friends in a lot of ways. And we've created a great community through the Patreon. And, you know, keep a lookout to my social media because hopefully sometime by I'm hoping the end of the summer I got this book out and uh, I'm available for bookings uh, for pro wrestling motivational speaking and seminars so reach out to me send me an email uh, and I will be sure to get back to you as soon as possible I just want to make a difference and enrich people's lives and you know be a dude and talk about dude stuff like we did today I absolutely love it, man. Again, I cannot thank you enough for being down to do the show. This was seriously a blast of a conversation for me to have, a bit of a bucket list conversation for me to have. First pro wrestler on the show. Heck yeah. And that's what's wild. You're only six years older than me. Yeah. But I still watched you on TV in the middle of the night, and I was like, that guy's cool. And now here we are. And now we made a podcast. Dude, seriously, though, thank you so much. Thank you. I really do appreciate it. We did it. Heck yeah. We made a podcast. Yay. So I cannot thank Greg enough for being down to be on the show. Um, He traveled down from his hometown of Cleveland to venture around Columbus and to do my show. And seriously, it meant a lot to get to have this conversation. Um, It means a lot that I can call Greg a friend now and that this conversation is forever etched in podcast stone. Uh, So if you want to see what Gregory Iron is all about, be sure to follow him at Gregory underscore Iron. If you want more podcasts to listen to and you are a wrestling fan, you should definitely go check out his podcast, Iron On Wrestling. It's available wherever you're listening to this show at right now, or you can follow it at Iron On Wrestling. Of course, be sure to double check and make sure that you're following this show at WYDHPod. Please toss a follow if you haven't yet. You can also follow me personally. I am at Ross Tyson just about everywhere. That's Instagram, TikTok. I don't know, Twitter's barely alive, but I'm over there too. I also ask you to double check that you are subscribed on whatever platform that you check this out on, whether it's Spotify, whether it's Apple Podcasts, I don't know, one of those random podcast apps that I know exist, but I've never, ever heard anyone ever tell me that they use. Uh, It's on there too, so check and find it. Uh, See if you're subscribed. Wherever it is though, I appreciate your support uh, more than you know. Uh, So take a quick moment as well if you want. Toss a five-star frog splash of a rating wherever you're listening to this at as well. Folks, all of this adds up. It truly helps. I know you hear it from every single creator, but I am no different. All of these things tell an algorithm that this show matters, and it really, really does add up. And, of course, if you do want to watch these these, uh, podcasts in video form, well, you can find those on my personal YouTube channel, That is youtube.com slash Ross Tyson, but that'll do it. That is a wrap for this episode. Shoulders to the mat for a count of three. We are out of here. So thank you so much for listening. If you watched on YouTube, thanks for looking. And I cannot overstate uh, ever, honestly, how much I appreciate anyone ever checking this podcast out or really anything else I do. And I also cannot say how happy I was to make this episode happen. So again, a big thank you to Gregory Iron, my guest, for sitting down, getting to know me for the first time, and sharing his story the way that he did. This was a very, very fun episode. And thank you for listening. Thanks for looking. Like I said, you are wonderful. And I'll catch you in the next one where I sit down with my next guest, whom you may or may not know, as they share their story that you for sure never heard. 